Okay. Good evening and welcome to Dufferin Life. I am so excited to be here live at the Orangeville Lions Home and Garden Show. Make sure you stay tuned in because we're gonna be here for a couple hours and we're gonna be talking about everything home and garden. But before I introduce my first set of guests, I'm gonna go over to Jerry and find out what he's up to tonight. Welcome to our 24th annual Home and Garden Show. Tonight we are going to have a wide arrangement of guests, people telling about what they do in our beautiful county of Dufferin County and um, letting you know that if you need anything for your home or garden, this is the place to see it. Back to you, Tina. Thank you so much, Jerry. I can't wait to meet the guests that you're going to be talking to tonight. Joining me tonight from the 10 and 10 Garden Center, we have Jazz Beer and Asha. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. You're very welcome. So I, I just want to start off by saying we're live and it snowed today. So we're, we're going to talk gardens <laughs> because we know that the snow is going to go away really, really soon. Oh, yes. <laughs> Anyways, so let's talk about that. So when should we start preparing our garden for the spring? Well, we can start as soon as the, the ground is workable. Uh, the idea is to get your garden ready so that when the May 2-4 weekend comes, we can have everything ready to go. Uh, go ahead. Uh, so, when we're, if we planted our garden in May 2-4 and there's still going to be frost coming forward because we don't know what's happening with the weather this year, um, can that cause a lot of damage to anything we've planted that weekend? Oh yes, it could. If you already planted before 2-4 or even after 2-4 and there is frost coming, the best thing to do, cover your plant as best as you could because if the frost hits it and it's a delicate plant, it will definitely kill it. Right, so we have to be very careful. Yes. That's why I plant in like August. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> no and, I, yeah. and I was telling you a little bit before that, oh, yeah. that I'm not much of a gardener, so <laughs> I really appreciate you guys being here because yeah. my husband does it all. I pick the plants, I tell him where to plant them, and then he takes care of it and makes yes. it a beautiful thing. Um, so what types of plants can we uh, plant in the spring? What are the best types of plants Okay, in the you can plant things like daffodils, um, hyacinth, snowdrops, gladius, bleeding hearts and they all you plant them as bulbs some of them you plant them as perennials and they will all come up in the spring and you get vibrant beautiful colors with them so when do we plant those when do we plant the bulbs like do we do that in the fall the year before you can do it in the fall okay or you can do it to usually daffodils and hyacinth tulips you can do it um around this time okay april Middle of April. That after would be the snow. Thing. After the snow, yes. <laughs> and it's going away, everybody. I promise you, it's going away. So, Jasper, what do we do to prep our garden before we plant things in it? Well, what we got to do is we got to make sure that the garden's ready. So, you got to make sure you take out any dead plants that you do not want, any okay. weeds, get that all cleaned up, and then make sure you have lots of organic compost. Uh, you can mix some uh, manure in there. And if, if need be, if it's a clay area, then you definitely want some peat moss just to loosen up the soil. So. Okay. Well, those are all things that I'm going to let my husband do. Uh, <laughs> but so when we're talking about planting perennials mm -hmm. and annuals, so okay. tell, why don't you tell us what a perennial is versus an annual and when the best okay. time to, print, uh, to plant those are? Okay. A perennial is something that comes up every year. Okay. So make sure when you're doing a perennial, make sure you're getting the perennial for your zone. If you don't get a perennial that's your zone and you get a hardier plant, a less hardier plant for your zone, you will kill it. It will not come back the following year. The best time to plant that, same thing again, when the ground is workable. So I would say mid-April, end April. For an annual, is a plant that comes back annually. You plant it for the summer, when the frost hits it, it will kill it, you will not get it back next year. And the best time to plant that, it would be the May 2-4 weekend. Okay. And again, if you should have frost, cover it, make sure you protect it, so it's not gonna get, you're not gonna kill it. Okay, so you said something that I don't know, so I'm okay. gonna come back and ask you. Okay. So what is a zone? How does that work? How do you know what your zone is? Okay, so we are, I'm in mono. Okay. Our zone, it's an upper zone four. Okay. So that tell you the climate you have, and um, how cold it's going to be. Okay. And if you're in the Brampton area, that's a zone five. Okay. So you need to find out what your zone, zone is. is. I don't know what my zone is. I just pick things and make my husband plant them. So <laughs> I, I'm so appreciative of him. <laughs> we, can, yeah. we can always help. At the yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is why we have the experts here is so that you can find out when to do these things. And if you're not aware, then you have to pop out to 10 and 10 Garden Center. But let's talk about mm -hmm. trees and, and hardy plants. Okay. Uh, because obviously those are not, those are 
permanent, they don't yes. move. Um, but is there a, time, a better time to plant a tree or a bush? A tree or a bush or a shrub, a uh, good time to plant it, I would say you would plant it, same thing, mid-April, end of April, May. Okay. That's a good time to plant them. Okay. All right. So when we are, um, how do you, just, okay, so I don't know. When do you decide, or how do you decide what type of tree works best for your space? Because sometimes you look at some of these trees and they're absolutely stunning and gorgeous, but then, you know, they may not work in your own property. So how do you, so, how do you pick something like that? Well, basically what you gotta see is how much space do you have? Do you want it for shade? Do you want an ornamental tree? Do you, what, you know, what is it that you're looking for? And you also have to look at what else you have in the area. So you wanna try to make sure that they are all, uh, that complement each other. Right, right. I mean, and that's part of it too, because you don't want to plant a big tree that has a lot of coverage that's over something right. that you planted that has full sun that's or right. needs full sun, yes. right? Exactly. Yes. And I would think that you would actually have to look at the height of the trees as well, right? Yes, definitely. Yes, definitely. definitely. The height of the tree, how wide it's going to be, how tall it's going to be, and if you know, if the shade is important to you, then you want something nice and big. If if, if not, if it's an ornamental, what colors do you want it? You know what colors you want the blooms to be and so you got to look at the whole you try picture. to complement against your land your existing landscape right right because yeah. i'm just thinking uh, there are some trees that if you plant too close to their house the roots spread right that's so right some, that's something they should ask you about yes how big the roots get yes. right exactly yes yeah. Wonderful. Okay, so this is my favorite thing because I only buy them in July because I always kill them prior to that. But hanging baskets. So hanging baskets are so beautiful, mm -hmm. um, but they're very tricky. Some, well, or maybe just for me, um, they're very tricky to keep alive in my world. So, um, how when do we hang the baskets? Okay, so your hanging basket. You can start hanging them outdoors. I would say by the middle of May, okay. when the temperature is 14 and above. Also, keep an eye on the on the weather. If you are going to have frost, you have to protect that basket. Okay. You have to either take in your gar garage or indoors, because many basket, if a frost hits it, it's either going to kill it or it take all the blooms and it take a longer time to c get, um, come back. Okay. If you um, want something earlier than that, I would recommend you to do pansies. Pansy is very, very cold hardy. <laughs> I was just going to say, so what is a hardy flower? <laughs> yes. Uh, do, do they require sun or shade, or does it matter? Uh, like part pansies? sun, part shade. Part sun. Yes. That's, I think my problem is as our, we have a deck yes. and we hang it, and part of it gets full sun, and then the yes. other side of the poor plant doesn't see the sun. So I think that so you, I so, should turn it? Turn it would yes. be one idea. Yeah. Yes. And pansy would do well in an area like that. Okay, so we've got some beautiful plants here. Mm -hmm. Are these indoor plants? Oh yes, they are. Okay, they so are. tell us a little bit about them. Okay, Marcia. so this is an African violet. Mm -hmm. So it, this is a air purifier and a pet friendly plant. Okay, uh, it get you. They give you a beautiful bloom. It make your your house indoors feel very warm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, guys, I'm, done. I'm nervous. And if, with the color, it makes the house warm. Right, and they and, come in yes, colors. and it come in different colors. You can have about six, seven different colors in these guys. And are these are these easy to kill? <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Though. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's it's a little bit tricky. Okay, if you don't know how to take care, you all the flowers will drop, and yes, you can easily kill this guy. Okay. So none for Tina. <laughs> <laughs> and tell me a little bit about this one. So this is a rare plant. This is a black ZZ. This is very hard to kill. Okay. This is very drought, drought tolerant, and it's it's an indoor plant and minimum amount of light. Okay. And you can neg neg neglect this plant, and it would come back like this. It's pretty, pretty, pretty hardy plant. This is my kind of plant. <laughs> for sure, for sure. So yeah, no, I mean it's very beautiful. So it doesn't flower. It's just no. no. It's just a foliage. Okay. So we're gonna pop back outside for a minute because I just mm -hmm. have another question. Sure. Um, so. There often there's plants that spread, okay. that, that spread and spread. Like you plant them, and you, the idea yes. is to fill a space. Yes. How do you stop them from going over the space that you want them to stay in? Okay. So the best way to do that depends on the size of the plant. You put it in a plastic pot okay. when you're planting it. You cut the bottom of the plant off, the pot off. Okay. You plant the plastic plant into the hole with your plant and that way it's just gonna spread to the area and it would help it from not spreading everywhere. That is That's awesome. That's a good because, trick. Uh, yeah, it is a, a yes. fantastic trick. I wish I would have known that before I planted some of mine that continue to spread and spread yes. and spread. Yes. Um, so 
we're, we're talking about planting. So how mm -hmm. far down should you dig to put something like a perennial that you that's going to come up every year? So it all depends on the perennial. Okay. You have some perennial with big rooting system. You have perennial with small rooting system. Mostly, um, most of the time when you buy a perennial, it has a tag on it. It will give you instruction of the depth okay. to dig. Right. That, yeah. And the yeah. and the width on, on and the width, yeah. yeah. Because yeah. exactly. when you're planning your garden, you really kind of have to take into consideration exactly. how wide everything's going to grow, That's not right. just how far to, to put it down That's in, right. in the dirt, right? Yes, yes, yeah, so absolutely right. All the instructions will come with it, basically. You know, the, the, the width the of it and the height that it will get to a maximum, so you can pretty well guess before you plant. What, how much area you need. It's good advice to actually always keep those tags, I would yes, think, too. I'm yes. so, like, I literally, choo, choo, I'm just like, oh, I've got them planted. I followed where it's supposed to be planted. This is where it needs to be. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so any advice for those people who are just starting out and, and doing their very first garden this year? Well, my advice to them, wherever you go to shop to do your gardening, if you're not sure what you're doing, speak to someone there. They would be able to help you and um, gardening is pretty, pretty easy. It's not hard. And the knowledge that you will get with time will help you a lot. Wonderful. I want to thank you both for joining me today and sharing about all this valuable information. Oh, thank You're you. You're very for welcome. Me. And it's our pleasure of being here. And wonderful. So, are we already out? at the Lions Club again. Tonight I'm here with Norm. He's representing the Blues and Jazz Festival. We all know that okay, festival. Dear, We're looking forward to it. Here. Norm, what is the purpose of your uh, yeah, booth it. here you tonight at the Blues and Jazz, uh, sorry, at the uh, Lions Club no, no, uh, Home Garden Show? Totally well, mean. this is the, uh, it's the 19th annual uh, recruitment drive oh, yeah. for the Orangeville Blues and Jazz Festival. It's being held for June the uh, 2nd uh, through the 4th, uh, the first week in June. And basically what we're doing is we're looking for uh, recruitments from high school to uh, retired uh, to uh, working families and uh, there's all kinds of jobs and basically we're looking at trying to recruit as usual about 250 people to the for the various jobs from event staff to beer garden to green team and all of the other positions that go into making this 80 act fantastic festival that's our 19th uh, version and everything is just uh, it's, re it's really exciting and this weekend we spend three days to just get signatures and reach out to people and have a good time and maybe play a little music too. Well, Norm, that's fantastic. Fantastic. Is there a website or something they can go to if they are not able to make it to the show? Absolutely. So it's all at www.orangevillebluesandjazz.ca or you can just Google orangevillebluesandjazz.ca. Thank you very much, Norm. Uh, back to you, Tina. We're getting close to one minute. I'll just tap the table. Hey Jerry, thanks so much for that. I can't wait until the Blues and Jazz Festival gets here. So have you ever wondered about what you should do or when you're supposed to change your windows and doors and how this is all happening? Well, we have an expert with us here to tell us all about it. Dave Patterson from Cedarport Windows and Doors, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It is my pleasure. Um, so let's talk about doors. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when when's a good sign or what's the, a sign that you need to replace your doors? Well, they, if they're not sealing properly or work, working or functioning, that would be something that you would pick up on. But quite often people are just looking to update the look of their house. Okay. Because um, there's a lot of new door systems out and people see other ones that might have been replaced in their neighborhood and they're going, I think it's time. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're feeling a big draft coming in. Yeah, of course. <laughs> that's one indication yeah, that maybe that's, you need a that's, new door. That's, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> With your windows as well, I would assume. Yeah. Wonderful. So, I, I mean, there are many types of doors that are out there. Tell us a little bit about the different types of doors. Traditionally, uh, there's always been wood doors and, and steel doors, and there still is. Uh, but there's fiberglass doors now, and a, a big reason people buy fiberglass is because you can simulate the look of a wood door without, you know, warping and, and, and the maintenance associated with wood doors. They're very popular. Okay. So, I'm assuming all doors are they come to you weatherproof because obviously they're mm -hmm. they're on the outside of the house yep. um, but when you're main is there anything that you need to main do to maintain your doors over the years not a lot okay not a lot actually they're, they're pretty they're, they're pretty, pretty self-sufficient yeah. yeah. on their own like a right? wood door would need to be uh, you know stained or painted every once in a while but um, you know, even the stain that goes on the fiberglass to give the wood look mm -hmm. uh, is very durable okay very durable and screen doors are they still popular because I, I see so many houses that don't have like a screen door and I, I always grew up with one and yeah. I always feel like we don't have one but yeah. I feel like we should have a screen door are they still popular <laughs> well they still are 
because people sometimes don't have a door that doesn't seal well, so they'll put a storm over it. That's a okay. traditional reason you had a storm. Okay. Um, but one thing about the new doors are so attractive. There's also the, the thought that you don't want to you don't want to cover it up. Right. So putting a storm door on a beautiful new door system uh, might take away from the aesthetics. And how long does it typically take to install a door? A uh, front door with side lights uh, would maybe be four hours. Okay. Or up to four hours. Every job's a little different. Okay. A, a single door, uh, you know, you can do that in, in maybe two. Okay. Yeah. okay. So every time you replace a door, do you have to replace the frame? Uh, you should, because if you don't, the old weather strips and a lot, a lot of the components that have to do with the sealing and operating properly are left. Okay. So you may still have a problem. It's best if you retire the whole system and, and get a complete new system. Okay, and you said something that I want to make sure everyone knows. What, so side lights, are those, mm -hmm. tell me what those are. Uh, so, yeah, so, so they're exactly what they sound like. Okay. Um, you know, they, they, they can operate, uh, uh, but most often they're fixed and so they're complementary to the door. Okay. So if the door has a, a decorative light in it, we would call that, mm -hmm. you'd get potentially the matching side lights so it looks, you know, the continuity's there. Right, and is that, like, are they side lights or are they actual, like, panels that match the door? What are the, or, or maybe I'm confusing. I don't know much about doors. This that's is why okay. we're here. Yeah, that, yeah well, that's right. <laughs> um, so they're actually, they're a, a door that you walk in and out has a door slab. That's what you're opening and shutting. Okay. And so side lights can have either a slab in them, and that makes them what's called the matching side light. Okay. Uh, or they can be just glass if, you, if you're looking to maximize the light coming out of your side light. So if I was looking at my house, and my I, I have a 26 and a half inch door, whatever it happens to be. Yeah. Um, and can I add the side? Like, can I add that, or is that something? Or I wouldn't be able to do that because I've got the brick there that's part of the house. Like, can you add things when you're? Well, doing? if there's enough room, you can you can enlarge the opening. Okay. You know, and there 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 are, you know uh, people in the industry that will do that for you. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. Um, so just giving me an idea because mm -hmm. I mean there's always been delays and when you when you order a product it has to take some time depending on the product that you order yep. um, and I know through COVID everything just kind of got really it, it backed was, up and we yep. don't want to talk about COVID so we're not going to yep. um, but delivery time on when you're looking for windows and doors I mean just an estimate I'm not going to hold you to it <laughs> right yeah depending on the door uh, it, sometimes uh, but um, I would say six to ten weeks okay yeah so that's not too bad then. well it's come back down Right, yeah, right. So it year. has gotten better. <laughs> it's gotten better. Thank goodness. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. And so, are colored doors really popular? Like, is that what's trending? Like, yeah. I see some houses that um, um, there's like a bright yellow door, yeah. bright red door. Is that uh, is that what's trending this year? Yeah, yeah. You want your door to pop a bit. Okay. Um, so sometimes you go absolutely, you know, something totally different. Sometimes you complement it to your soffit. Uh, or your garage doors, mm -hmm. um, but there are a lot of really neat colors out there, and there's, and there's a lot of colors available, including custom colors. Yeah, well, we did a reno on our house, and we had uh, a new front door put in, mm -hmm. um, and I was like, they're like, just pick a front door. So I was thinking it was just going to be, you know, just that quick little, oh, this is the one. But there are so many different oh, yeah. designs, and there's like a half window, a three quarter, mm -hmm. a, there's a full window too. You I should come work for me. <laughs> <laughs> So after we leave here, yeah. I'm going to go over. To That's the, right. <laughs> going to go over to the booth and, and do that sort of yeah. thing. So yeah. let's start talking about windows mm -hmm. because windows, um, obviously, if you've got air coming in, you need to replace your windows. But are yeah. there any other signs that your window may need a little bit of love and care or yeah. replacement? Well, it, if, if your windows would, then, then simply rot could be a, a problem. You okay. Know, that they rot, they rotted over time. Um, but usually it's a component failure. So the window's made up of glass and your glass can get foggy, mm -hmm. your hardware can fail, your screens can get, you know, just run down. And uh, most people realize they don't want to put, you know, there's a limit to how much more money you want to put into the old window. Right. So if you're thinking that way, it's probably time to replace the whole thing. Right, so we had an older house and we had to replace like, an old bathroom window. Yeah. But then we realized that when the window was replaced, it looked beautiful from the inside, but when we were outside, there was um, siding, like it didn't fit the same way. Is that normal? <laughs> well, you, you need to rely on, on, on good installation mm -hmm. and, uh, and to, uh, with whoever's installing your windows, go outside with them. And hopefully they're going to point out something that you're probably noticing too. Right. And you should ask them how they address it or they should bring it up. They probably will. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that was a, a window we did many, many years ago. And mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> right. we were just like, we walked out of the house and it was like, there's like soffit, or not soffit, but siding missing. But anyways, yeah. enough about me. Right. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about installation of windows and doors. Mm -hmm. Can you, is that something that you can do year round or is that something that we have to, you know, kind of schedule in the better weather? Uh, it's best case scenario above zero Celsius. And that has to do with the caulking and the foam 
setting up properly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if it's a good day and it's minus two, that's fine, but it's, it is best to do windows above zero. Okay. So if it's a good day in January, that's fine. Okay. So when the house shifts, yeah. how, that can affect the door, how it opens and closes. Is that, or should it affect the door? Right. I, I, you know what, over the years, uh, I haven't seen much of that. It could. If your house shifts, it may, it may uh, throw your window out of square, or, so it may not open or shut properly. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, but, and you think that would happen more, but it's not, it doesn't happen that much. Okay, yep. that's good to know, it's yeah. good to know. Yep. So you need to have somebody who knows what they're doing when they're installing it. Yes, <laughs> yeah, experience is paramount. Yeah, 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 because I can't see that that's something that you can just, I mean, I wouldn't want to take it on myself, but I'm sure some people do. Right, Some people yes. buy their doors and, yeah. and install them do. themselves. Yeah. Um, so when you're talking about a window, is that like a longer installation process? Is that something that takes a little bit longer? Uh, it, it's proportionate to the size of the window. Okay. Yeah, so like, a, you know, so you have to remember when someone comes in, they have to kind of set up their equipment and do everything they have to do whether they're doing one window or ten mm -hmm. so that's if you're only doing one window it may only take an hour to put it in but it right. may take them an hour out, out, you know uh, additional mm -hmm. to pack up right so a larger window might take it uh, you know three to four hours and windows I mean they come in all shapes and sizes obviously yeah. um, are windows are there, there's standard sizes but then can you customize the size of a window <clears throat> yep yeah Mo most of the time people are uh, uh, you know, custom sizing the window to what they're replacing. Okay. So it, so it looks proper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you have, this is a question, this is a personal question. Yeah. So I have a nice big window yeah. in the front of my house. Can I turn that into a bay window? Like, yeah. is, that, is that possible? Yes. <laughs> yeah. How does, how does one do that? Because it's almost like you have to have something to support it to make. Well, it, well it, you, the, the window person needs to do a site visit. Okay. So they need to understand and advise you on whether the uh, conditions are proper for that. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, just because I've always wanted that lovely bay window, you know, yeah. where you can just kind of sit and look outside. Oh yeah. You know, but I'm going to wait until my 125 pound German Shepherd stops jumping on my window before I put that one in. Right. So how long have you been doing this? Uh, Cedarport uh, has been selling windows and doors since 1984. Okay. And how did you get into doing windows and doors? Because it's well, really we were, very specific. Well, my dad was in the log home business, and we were selling a lot of windows. And then the representative from the company asked us if we ever wanted to consider selling windows at a retail level to contractors. And we kind of said, yes, sure. So now that's all we do. So if you've got somebody who's buying an older home, yeah. um, what advice would you give them about looking at their windows and doors? Well, an older... An older home might be, have a lot of air infiltration, mm -hmm. so you know replacing their windows and doors is going to be a big help. Right. There's no question about it. There are a lot of the grants out there now, and that should be mentioned that there's grants that you can get to help you afford to replace your windows. Right, because it is. I mean, if you're looking, you're endeavoring to replace all of your windows and doors at the same time, it can be a hefty amount of money yep. to, to invest in. Oh yeah. But a good investment. Absolutely. Yeah. So. And of course, that will also affect the energy in your house. Like the energy, mm -hmm. it's an energy saver, right? Yeah, well, oh, yeah. Not energy saver, but um, heat saver. More Absolutely, than yes. Heat energy, I think I'm talking about yeah. the same thing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Wonderful. So, can you replace, I mean, do people still do wooden windows? Like, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Often they have aluminum clad on the exterior to, to reduce the maintenance, but uh, in a certain class of home, that's still around. Okay. Yeah. I was shocked with that one, I will tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we sell a lot of wood. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And are they mainly in older homes? Not necessarily. No. Nope. nope. See, I was, I've always loved that too, like the old farmhouses where they've got the wooden yeah. windows and that oh, sort yeah. of thing. But oh, I didn't yeah. realize that that was something that we did, or still could do. Right. Well, some people just prefer a wood window uh, they versus, say, a vinyl window because they just feel it's uh, the wood would be best uh, uh, match the, their home. Right. So, you mentioned briefly, um, we were talking about how you should match it. So when we're looking at new doors, because like I said, I've seen like powder blue and yellow and yep. like all these different colors. Is there one specific color that's trending? And, and what, do we, what do we look at again to pick a really good color? Well, other than white, the, 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 the biggest color by far is black. Okay. Yeah, and, and most of the time it's white on the inside, but it can be black. They can split finish them, okay. which is nice to know that you can okay. do that, right? Um, other than that, it really is quite a rainbow of, you know, it's really subjective. People would want a purple door, maybe. <laughs> I know. I see yeah. sometimes they'd be driving it around, um, 
like you see like oh my gosh look at that like purple yeah. or yellow or yeah. blue or anything like yeah. that yeah um, it makes the house pop it does it does yeah. it's absolutely wonderful yeah. um so and i know that in the doors yeah. there's i want to say there's like a black i don't know what it's called but you can you can tell me what it's called like okay. you've got it in the window and there's like a black design in it but is there a certain name for that like it's caming caming yep caming that's the, the de we call it a decorative light yes okay yeah. so that's a, I, so it's one of my favorites so that was what we put in our door okay that sort of thing um so any other any other advice you have for anybody looking for windows or doors um well just go with a, a reputable uh, uh supplier uh mm -hmm. it's been around for a while is uh, that uh that you can get referrals from or see other jobs in the area uh, you know, there's lots of uh, lots of people in the window business, so you should be able to find someone locally. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. And then it's all about making a plan, right? Because mm -hmm. budget must be very important. Yes. Some people will do them a few at a time, just just because it is can you know they have a budget for a lot of things. So, well, you know. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, well, Dave, I want to thank you so much for joining us today, and we're going to go back over to Jerry and see who's with him. Hi there, Jerry Gould again of the Orangeville Lions Club. I'm standing here with Kylie Ann. She's with the County of Dufferin. Her booth has a big sign about climate change. Kylie, uh, what is the County of Dufferin doing about the climate change and what is the significance of your booth? Great. So the County of Dufferin is committed to taking urgent action on climate change. We have a plan that was passed in 2021 that aims to get the county to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. So our plan focuses on a variety of different actions related to sustainable transportation, home energy, agriculture and environment, and community planning. A few of the initiatives that you may have seen out and about in the community include the installation of an EV charging network for the public to use. We also have a program running to help farmers adopt regenerative agriculture practices uh, on their farms. It's a farmer-led program that we launched last year. This year, we also launched a youth climate activation circle, so a program to empower our local youth to participate in climate solutions. And we've got a lot more coming. It's a long road to net zero, but the county is committed to continuing that journey. Well done, Kylie. I know you guys are doing a great job. If somebody wanted more information and they're not able to make it to our show, is there a website or something they could go to for more information? Absolutely. We really encourage people to get involved. DufferinCounty.ca slash climate change uh, is the spot to go to. And you can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Climate Action in Dufferin. Thanks, Kylie. And back to you, Tina. Thanks, Jerry. That was so interesting. So one of the things that I was, I've been talking about tonight is how I did a renovation on my home. I did a new kitchen. Um, and then, you know, with the new kitchen comes a new floor over here and around the room and a little bit of new paint. And you just, you never realize it. So joining me today, we have AJ and Cassia from AC Custom Reno and KC Custom Interiors. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, anytime, us. yeah. And I will say they, they did my reno in my house. And <laughs> just email me, I'll send you a picture. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about doing a renovation because yep. no matter what size renovation you're actually talking about it's a big project no yep. matter what it is unless yep. you're just doing something you know like oh I'm gonna paint my bathroom or something yeah exactly. it's a little bit different so what should a homeowner do first when they're thinking about planning a renovation uh, I think the biggest thing when planning a renovation is one your scope of work figure out what you want to do and budget it all comes down to ultimately what you can and can't do from there, I think finding the right contractor after that it would be the next step. Okay. Yeah. So kind of having a plan of what you want. Yeah. But then there's sometimes, like me, um, where you kind of had a plan, but you weren't sure what the plan was. But it's it's good to you know you speak to somebody and get and get those ideas. Whether there's somebody that's designing it for you, and then you're going to build it, or you're going to hire somebody to to do the, the work for you. You need to have some sort of plan. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I know you touched on how important budget is, but let's go into a little bit more detail. So when we're planning a project, you have a number in your head, yeah. um, and then normally a quote is provided or whatever's happening. So how important is that budget? Uh, the budget is the backbone of the whole project. It, without the budget, we can't complete any works. Yeah. So my suggestion is take your budget minus 5% off the top and use that as a contingency and that the remaining 95% would be a safe number to start off of. Now again, that alters according to the size of your project, but something like a kitchen or a bathroom or anything that's usually a safe number to kind of start with right. and work off of. And things come up, right? Yep. You must, you, 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 I'm sure you could tell a million <laughs> stories, AJ, about somebody who started a reno and then thought, no, now I want pot lights. Yep. No, now I want this over yeah. here. No, I want something built here. Yep. So t when you're thinking about your budget, it's really important to say like, okay, well, maybe you have that extra in case 
you want to add, add in. Yeah. 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 Does it happen often? Uh, every project. Uh, yeah. Every project. <laughs> I don't think we've had one that hasn't yeah, happened I, uh, yeah, yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's true though, but I mean, when you're looking at it, like you know, when at you, this point, you might yeah. as well, like yeah. you know, yeah. if I have this, I might as well have that because yeah. we're already there and doing it. So how far in advance? Like, people want things done like yesterday. Yeah. So how far in advance should somebody reach out to a renovation company or an, a design company to um, to start the plan happening? Truthfully, I believe as soon as you think you want to do the project. Okay. Start My thing, doing your homework. Yeah, do your homework and everything, and also building a relationship with your contractor. Like a good contractor will work with you for months on end, for six yeah. months, eight months. If you come to me and say Christmas time, thinking of this reno, I think building that relationship between the two of you helps to get mitigate which way the reno is going to go. Right. So and it allows you to have more information, allows you to make changes, you know, kind of change the scope of work, add to the scope of work, remove the scope of work alter your budget if you need to, right? Like, yeah. so there are things that you can plan ahead for, so there is really no, like, set time. If you're looking to just turn around and do a reno, I would say three months would be a good yeah. lead time to get drawings, order right. material, confirm a budget, get financing, and so on. Yeah, yeah. and oftentimes, I, I would imagine, too, that there are delays in getting materials in that are no fault of anyone's. It's just yeah. the way that the system works. So, how, so if you're in the middle of a reno and you've yeah. got somebody's house just torn apart what happens when there's a delay it's just a so we've learned through experience um, to order all the material before we start the demo okay so we go through the design we go through the layout we know exactly what we need and then we place the order for what, whatever material we need so whether it be tile drywall lumber hardwood vanities kitchen cabinets and then once we know we have the, all of that then we would say okay we have it or we know when it's going to come in we can start on this date and then we know we'll have it that way people aren't displaced for a long time because it's right. frustrating living through a reno as you know yeah <laughs> I do it's remember not for everybody yeah, bit, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I think for me the, the hardest part was not having like somewhere to cook especially like, in function. the kitchen right yeah yeah, yeah. yeah like important. it was just it's just simple and I can't tell you how happy I was when I walked in and seen my stove in place, in my fridge in place. <laughs> yeah. it's like that moment of like this is why I did this <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah right yeah. you forget about all the bad yeah yeah, yeah. it's like for having sure, a baby sure. and there was nothing bad I think I think just people get you know they you know and do, do contractors work on multiple projects at the same time yeah yeah, yeah. 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 So you're always going in that sort of yeah yeah and people have to and I think that's harder for the people who are having the work done yes. to understand perhaps exactly. yeah like that maybe <laughs> yeah you know they yeah. yeah there's there's timing in between each things that happen like you yes. can't come in and you know put the put the walls up and paint and then get the floor like it, there's all in a the process. same yeah we had to leave leg time between project between trades too right so mm -hmm. say our drywaller is delayed for a week and our flooring guy comes in our painter comes in he's gonna get you know Kind of a little upset because he's like well you're not even ready for me so we have to allow for that lag time in case we do hit delays or a homeowner wants to add more electrical well that's going to add three days to the project now my drywaller can't come in for three days later so like those delays sometimes if everything's on schedule you're going to have those you know yeah. dead days in the house but yeah. we did account for the worst and you know what it's okay sometimes too because you kind of like it's a break from the noise yeah. yes <laughs> yeah like if there's no more banging there's no more Absolutely. you know um so the, you brought up the different trades that that are involved in doing renos and let's yeah. talk a little bit about the different people that work with contractors and do all contractors have those people or do people have to source their own mm -hmm. trades people? Um, that was four questions in one. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So contracting is, I find, a little bit of a gray area because a lot of you know companies are calling themselves a contractor or so forth. I break it down to you have your handyman who will hang mirrors, set doorknobs, you know, do small replacements, fix a le leaky tap. Then you have your renovation company who will come in and I believe should only do cosmetics. Okay. They should replace trim, do flooring, stuff like that. They shouldn't include any red seal kind of trades, you need a licensed tradesman for that. And then you have your general contractor who subcontracts everything, that's what we do. Okay. So with that, we'll bring in Red Seal Trades, we'll bring in like a licensed electrician, a licensed plumber, framers, we'll bring in architects, uh, engineers as we need, and so forth. And that's what makes you into a general contractor versus a renovation company versus a handyman. So it's almost like a small, medium, large. Right. And right? you have to kind of think of what the scope of your project is yeah. and what you really need done. Yeah. Right. And I would assume that there um, you would need a permit. Like do it. Yeah. And I'm assuming the reno company takes care of getting all the permits and yeah. that for anything. Yeah. So if you're doing a kitchen, you need a permit. Uh, it depends. Depends on <laughs> yeah. what you're doing. If it's just a cosmetic, you don't. Okay. Now, if you start rearranging plumbing, taking out load-bearing walls and so forth, that's when you need a permit. 
Okay. You can find everything like that online. Like you can do your due diligence. We give homeowners a package on when you should get a permit, when you shouldn't, on like where you can go to find your information with the Ministry of Labor, WSIB, on how to protect homeowners. So there's that's why I said the lead time to start a rental. Like there's so much information you can educate yourself with that yeah. there is no set lead time. Like the sooner the better. Okay. All right. So we're we're gonna skip over now to. Once it's all done, you yes. have to make it look beautiful. The and, and you stuff. do many you need all the pretty stuff. Yeah. So what type of trends are happening in colors right now? So we're we've seen light colors be really popular for a long time and now it's starting to kind of move over to more moody, darker colors. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's kind of starting, okay. I should say, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's what's trending in the paint kind of color design um, aspect. And then other trends that we're seeing is arches. Okay. So like in the windows, in doorways, really? in built-in cabinets, yeah. Archways. There's lots of archways yeah. and like... <laughs> I'm already like, hey, wait. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing after the show? <laughs> yeah. How soon can you come back? Yeah. No. Yeah. no, I love my kitchen. Yeah. I love my yeah. kitchen. So let's, like, so when we're talking colors and you're saying like it's going from light to dark, like, are, is there one specific color that stands out that a lot of people are... Uh, green towards? is very popular right now. Okay. So like a forest green or um, more of like a moody green, not really like okay. a bright green. Okay. Um, that's actually trending right now. Um, dark gray has always been very popular. It will continue to be black is very popular and will continue to be for a while. Um, yeah. So, so when we're picking, like if, I'm, if, if you've got a brand new room, let's yep. say it's a living room now and you're, and you're deciding on flooring, you're deciding on colors, is it the floor that decides the color of the walls or do you, do you get the color normally the color of the walls first and then see what floor complements them um, it depends on the client right so if we have a client that's like I absolutely love this paint color then we will work from there so okay. if you love this paint color what floor is going to complement that usually I would start with the flooring because there's only so many that you can pick from whereas paint colors there's a million yeah, right there is. <laughs> so that's the way I like to do things but like I said we've had homeowners who are like it has to be this color so then we'll work back from there. So let's talk about what's trending in flooring. Yes, so vinyl flooring is very popular right now. It's come a long way. Um, looks very much like hardwood, but it isn't. It's waterproof or water resistant. It's great if you have young kids, large animals, even small ones. Um, so that is actually, I would say, trending a lot. Having said that, hardwood will always be hardwood. I know, right? I, I, I love me some hardwood floors, yeah. I really, really do. So, so let's talk about hardwood floors. I mean, I mean, my hardwood floors went through heck with my between my pets and my kids yep. and people moving furniture and not picking it up properly and all those sorts yep. of things. Is a hardwood floor something it's easily replaced or do you have to take it all out and replace it all in like can you buff it and make it better you can refinish a hardwood floor yeah. um, it really depends on the condition of it so it breaks down to how damaged is it can we repair it, it if there's a lot of wear on it you're gonna get you know bumps and grooves in it you're always gonna see them yeah. darker floors is sand them out the stain goes a little bit deeper in them especially like you know a very deep yeah. like oak mm -hmm. you'll never sand that stain right out so it really depends on the actual project okay from a contractor's perspective, taking it out and putting it new is always the best way to go, but you know, there are a lot of floors that you can salvage. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you for giving us this amazing information. <laughs> thank you. I really appreciate yep, you appreciate joining it. us. Um, and now we're gonna go over to Jerry and see who he's got to talk to today. Hi, I'm back again, Jerry Gould of the Orangeville Lions. I'm standing here with my friend and colleague from the Grand Valley Lions. Kevin, your booth is right next to mine. What are, what's the Grand Valley Lions doing here tonight? Uh, we're selling tickets on our duck race, which is May 27th in the Valley. What it is is uh, we sell tickets and then there's a duck dropped out of a, a container that's hosted by Grand Valley Crane Rental. And the, the ducks are dropped in the river, they float down, they spout, go into a slot at the bottom and the corresponding ducks win, that are winners are compared to the numbers on the tickets and those are the winners. So we have 103 prizes, totaling almost $30,000 in value. And all the money raised goes back into the community. So we support minor hockey, uh, minor soccer, uh, Orangeville Hospital, Groves Memorial in Fergus. We also help out with uh, hospice, uh, the hospices in the community, and all different little things in the town that need uh, some help that the government doesn't do. 
right? Yeah. Kevin, I, I've been part of the duck race over there for a number of years, watching it is always fun to watch. If someone's not able to make it here tonight, how might they get their hands on one of those tickets, I mean, one of those ducks? They can uh, go to our website, which is Grand Valley uh, Lions, and they can do an e-transfer, and we'll uh, send them a copy of a, a ticket and show them which one's theirs. Um, that's probably the easiest way. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, you know, in the in the community, the Lions Club do so much great work, and you're just uh, just proved that they are continuing to do so. Thank you very much. Back to you, Tina. No, don't worry. Okay, good. Thank you so much, Jerry. So sometimes you're always looking for that one place, that one place that can give you all the answers. Joining me today, we have two lovely people. We have Bill and Vicki from Shelburne Home Hardware. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, nice you're to welcome. be here. Nice to be here. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So let's talk a little bit about when someone, like, planning a project because I think it, sometimes it can be extremely overwhelming for someone to look at something like a reno or you know an outdoor project of building a deck and you don't know where to go you don't know what to do um, so let's talk about what somebody where they should start if someone's planning a, a project for their home well when somebody comes into our store they're either going to be coming with a set of plans looking for a set of plans or looking for um, options okay um, so we make sure that they go bring a set of plans or we would provide them sets of plans and ask them whether they're doing a renovation we have a renovation department we have an installs we have a kitchen design center and we have beaver home and cottages with a turnkey so you get to pick what you want a right. good thing is a township too so obviously go visit the township make sure that you're able to do what you need to do on the area where you're going to be okay yeah. so let's, let's talk a little bit about that so if somebody wants to build an addition to their home they would obviously need a building permit yes correct yes, yes. and Definitely then so one. And I think what I love um, is the fact that people can come in and, and gather information because I think that people sometimes get overexcited like you're like, I really want to do this, I want to go out and I'm just going to buy the lumber and I'm going to get started and they it doesn't work that way. It doesn't. <laughs> no. It doesn't. So this is not recommended people. <laughs> exactly. Sure. Pre-planning is a good thing. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So let's say for instance we're, we're building a deck. So what is the type of information that people need? To, to move forward with the project. That's perfect, actually. So if people can come in and talk to us about that, because a lot of the time, you uh, don't necessarily need a permit for that. Okay. So depending on the size of the deck, if you're attaching to the house, if you're not. So that's a good thing, actually, to come in and talk to us about that. Okay. So before you have to go and maybe talk to the township or anything like that. Right, right. Um, so when you're planning a big project, what are some of the things that people, and you're going to do it yourself, DIY. I always want to say D DIY. DIY. I don't know why. Then I have to say it in my house. In my head. Not my house. In my head. Do it yourself. Okay. So somebody wants to do the project themselves. What are some of the things that they can expect to happen when they're taking on a, a bigger project? Uh, maybe some delays with product. So they want to make sure they're planning ahead of time for timing and all that stuff. Uh, because obviously through COVID and everything, we saw a lot of delays on quite a few products, which is still kind of following over to that too with delays so that's huge so it makes your time frame and everything you're expecting okay yeah. so permits. don't start ripping everything out yeah permits. exactly permits. yeah permits are a huge issue mm -hmm. uh, making sure you got your land uh, you're going to be building close to the river away from the lake up on a hill septic sewer all mm -hmm. the underground stuff is pretty important yeah, that would be pretty important, especially, I would think too, like you can't just start, like if you're doing something, I don't know, in the front of the side of your house, you don't want to just start digging and then you hit wires and whatnot. That's right, right. Yeah. exactly. So you yeah. Gotta, yeah, exactly, you gotta get locates done and everything, right? So again, a bigger project like that, you wanna go start with the township and make sure you're following all that protocol. Wonderful. Um, so how important um, is having a budget? <laughs> <laughs> Very. <laughs> and this time of day, everybody. Yeah, that was funny. Yeah. Budget? No, yeah. it's not. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. We've seen a lot of projects go over budget, yeah. and we don't want that to happen for anybody. Right. We'd like to stay within the budget, and and make sure it's going to be a quality home or rental that you're going to like and enjoy forever. So. So when people are, are planning a reno or something like that, um, and and you need to bring in, because obviously when you're planning a reno, um, depending on if you're doing it yourself. I mean, you're not a licensed electrician, you're not a plumber, you're not a, like, so do you recommend that people go out and find qualified people or do you give guidance? 
uh, guidance and uh, a lot of home hardwares actually have install programs. So you can come in and talk to like myself or anybody that runs install programs to get that kind of idea with how to do that, who to contact, all that stuff. Because we do have recommendations for contractors as well. We have, right, a, lot, so. we have a lot of contractors that come in that are strictly home builders and we're a lot of contractors are just renovators. Okay. So we would recommend uh, two, three options for you. Meet, sit down with the contractors, understand that they're on the same page as you are, mm -hmm. and then you'll be able to, you know, work through us with the contractor and we were usually work in a trio. Yeah, so I mean whether they're coming to the store or doing it on their own or just kind of coming in and getting what they want, I'm I mean I'm always of the opinion that it's always good to get a couple of quotes on yes. doing things, not just going with one you just and doing your research. Yes. How important is research when you're doing a pro a big Very. project? But or you gotta even watch a project, yeah, yeah, but you gotta watch where you're going to because a lot of people you hear all about the rabbit holes now and online and stuff like that. You start looking at something and then it brings you to something else and everything like that, right? So just make sure it's a reputable place that you're searching. Right. So and that's true true advice so what let's talk about a little bit about what's trending in home renovations we're gonna start on the inside and then we're gonna work our way to the outside sure so what's, what's trending in home kitchens renovations? bathrooms mm -hmm. rec rooms um, are the are the main thrust of what everybody's been changing over for the last three years right so well, I mean, I said we weren't going to talk about COVID, but let's talk about that because there was such an influx of people that were at home now and mm -hmm. took on projects. That must have been stressful on your end. Uh, <laughs> yep. Being locked down for 167 days out of 365 one year was tremendous stress. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we managed to get through it and a lot of people trusted the fact that we had a checkbox and we were blessed to be open. Yes. Right. So we were we were a little lucky shows in groups and, and we, were, we were able to satisfy most of the reno needs that people needed. So we were lucky. Yeah, and I think, I, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I was planning a reno, mm. and then COVID hit, and then I was like, I'm not doing a reno. Um, which I think, and then I think 90% of the world went in the opposite That's direction. That's right. They did. Yeah. Yep. They did. Thinking I'm going to take advantage of this time. Yeah. Yep. I mean, we did. We decided not to do it because bringing people into your home and that sort of thing is we were trying to avoid that at the time and yes. yep. that sort of thing. But uh, yeah. Okay. So we talked about permits and projects and budgets. Um, Let's talk a little bit about outside. What's what's is sure. there anything trending outside? Outdoor this year? living, fireplaces, um, outdoor kitchens, gazebos, outdoor, outdoor kitchens. kitchens. Tell me about an outdoor kitchen. What goes in an outdoor mm, kitchen? Oh my <laughs> god! I just went through it myself. <laughs> did. Uh, well, you've got you've got built-in barbecues. You've got pizza ovens that have been going crazy. Mm, huge. You've got sinks, outdoor uh, um, ice cube makers. It's it's the outdoor expansion. Wow. Yeah. Honey, just to let you know. Um, <laughs> Outdoor kitchen, next project. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's, it's what's going on. It's uh, yeah. cooking grills and having the gazebo over top that will actually sh shed you from the rain, snow, and also uh, space heaters. Um, okay. Yeah, propane propane heaters. Propane also. heaters and actually built-in gas heaters. Yeah. Wow. So, and that's safe? I'm just, yep, 100%. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm yep. just thinking enclosed no. gas. Just yeah. gives me the <laughs> I just went through that complete thing. It's, really? Yeah. So people are outdoor building, living. Outdoor living. So yep. they're building barbecues like into like a an island. That sort of yep. like sure. Yep. That sort of thing. Yep. I am intrigued, Bill. I'm I'm showing intrigued. my pictures. There's yeah, lots of nice this, pictures. Yeah. yeah. Wow. wow. It's amazing what people are doing, and it's not only just me on my street. Probably about 15 people out of 17 houses on our street. Really. All completely did a backyard rental. Well, a lot of people are doing years. staycations, right? right. Yes. So they're staying home more. Right. So they're able to now do that. And if your house is a little bit smaller, you can make it bigger now because then you're outside. So oh, nice. it's a lot better. Well, the new regulations are allowing the extra uh, garage to be converted into house living quarters now with Bill, that Bill 124. Wow. And so that's added a whole new dimension to uh, an in-law suite, an extra bedroom out back, right. a place to rent and re and and um, lease or rent. Wow! Airbnbs are popping up, mm -hmm. so yep. it's a whole new program. I am program. learning new and exciting things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Margaret, you got to love it. That's right. That's we have great ideas. We have great ideas. <laughs> well, absolutely. I'm just like I didn't. I, didn't, I would never even thought about turning my garage into like a living space. Yep. I would love to turn my garage into a living space. And we're, and we're selling. We're selling packages like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is this is good stuff. And this it's a tiny stuff, house yeah. projects too, right? Yes. Right. So those are those are coming on hot right now too. Yes. Okay. So if if you somebody wants to build an extension on their home, yep. that is got to be a massive project. I would think that would require a lot of 
planning. Planning, yeah. A good architect. Yep. A good contractor. Mm -hmm. And plans. Planning so that your elevations are matching when you're when you're busting a wall out through to a second level or a garage walk in through on a lower level. It's it's a good good project to make sure you got a good architect and and a good contractor that's going to make it all tie together. Right, right, because like like the, it, because you can't build it exactly like it was if it was built 75 years ago, right? Nope. So, no, yeah. not with the new uh, regulations. Uh, regulations and all yep. that stuff now. So, yep. and it, everything's got to be so energy efficient and so tight that yeah, all that stuff's changed now. So, right. yeah. All right. Yep. So. When, when people are looking to start this project, how far in advance should they order um, their supplies? You start the project with a year and a half in mind. Okay. And wow. one year on materials. Yeah. And if you think it's going to be a three month project, you can double it. Okay. Minimum. Just from the contractor start to the end. Turnkey idea. Okay. That's yep. sound right? Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah, well, lead times have dropped. I know, like, in my space, I do, like, a lot of windows and doors. So lead times have definitely come down. They used to be, like, 20, 22 weeks. Now they come down to, like, two to four weeks kind of thing. Okay. So at least that is in the right direction. So it's the contractors available to do the job, which is actually stretching right. it back out. There's a need for contractors and trades. There is. Right. Huge. Yes. And that's a big push in Ontario is to bring back the trades right. and trade training sessions and... It's it's important that you know we need to we need uh, a new generation of trades to learn. Well, this is it, or else we won't be able to build or do 100%. anything, right? Yeah. Like uh, the, I, you know, my sons are both in the trades, and it's where uh, to be right now? You know, and that's and honestly that's where the money is as well. For yep. you can get paid well in the trades, and you, can. you yep. learn a skill, and that skill just carries itself that's on. That's right. Yep. right. Exactly. Yeah, my boys are like that too. They're both in a trade as well. Yeah, it's great. So. When we're talking, so if I wanted to build, here's we go. This is another one for my husband. Um, so I have here's a, the card. <laughs> I have a two-story yes. home. Yes. Yes. Um, my my neighbors who have the two-story home, just like mine, have a, a deck on their upper level. Is it hard to like create a door in the dining room so you've got this walkout? No. Nope. Like, nope. not no? I did that nope. in my house. <laughs> I, yep. I had a 1,600 square foot house. Now it's now 3,000. Wow. But it's got a master on the second floor, and it's got a cantilevered deck that goes straight out. And it just, it looks so spectacular. So I'm just going to have to come live at your house, Bill. <laughs> yeah, sure. You've got everything I already you can. want. You can, sure, no problem. Again, as long as you find a contractor yes. that knows how and what they're doing. Right. How, how they to can tie explain. into the old, exactly. old extension. Like That's you want right. to do an extension and you just want to have an upper level with a deck and that, mm -hmm. you need to have the proper... Um, Person, the yeah. joist, I guess I'm trying footings to, and footings joists and joists and, joists and yeah. the proper yep. yeah. Yeah. attachments and everything, yeah. so but, which the contractor would know all about, right? Yeah, so. well, when we first bought our house, this is 25 years ago, yep. um, we uh, our deck wasn't even attached to our house. Oh, <laughs> right. we, and we have a two story house, so that was right. a bit of a undertaking. It was, yeah, it was, yeah, it was a little bit <laughs> wow. people walked down the stairs, and it was a little like wobbly. This, this, oh, yeah. geez. <laughs> So it is important to have somebody who knows what they're doing. Exactly. 100%. Right? Yes. And if you don't know, then come ask somebody who can give you that type of advice or those types right. of recommendations. That's right. Wonderful. Vicki and Bill, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. It was great. Thanks. Thanks. We're going over to Jerry to see who comes up next. Hi there, Jerry Gould of the Orangeville Lions Club. I love Orangeville. I'm here with Derek of the town of Orangeville to talk to you about some of the Orangeville hot topics. Hi, Derek. Hi, Jerry. How you doing? I'm good, thanks. Good, good. So you love Orangeville. So Orangeville has been designated as a hot tourist area of, in Ontario. So our tourist people have just rebranded Orangeville as Love Orangeville. We're trying to attract people from the cities to come up here, enjoy our nice cafes downtown. You know, we just did Broadway Bricks. We're trying to make it more attractive for people. And uh, we all love Orangeville, and we're trying to get more people up here. Uh, another big thing in town is right now we've got our uh, spring registration for our aquatics and camps. Uh, it's online. It's on orangeville.ca. Uh, already we've 60 to 80 percent full, so please visit the website and uh, register for that. Um, right now we are offering a free aquatics leadership program to anyone who wants to uh, become an aquatics leader. We're, we're reaching out to the, our young community uh, in, in hopes of trying to train them to be uh, leaders in our aquatics. Uh, we've just recently done a tree canopy survey where Orangeville, we've identified about 30% of Orangeville uh, has a tree canopy. We're hoping to increase that to about 40% so over the next few years. Uh, we are doing lots of construction this year. Okay. Uh, we, oh, 
We, uh, we're building a new transit terminal over by the Dufferin Centre where uh, we'll be uh, putting most of our buses. We are having a water meter replacement program this year where every water meter in town will be replaced over the next 18 months. This is gonna increase the efficiency of our water meters. Uh, we've just recently partnered with the CBC. We're doing the plant uh, trees in Orangeville on May 22nd. Wow, Derek, Orangeville is a very busy place and we love we Orangeville. Love Orangeville. Yep. Back to you, Tina. Thank you so much, Sherry, and thank you to the town of Orangeville. So we've talked a little bit about how you're building, where, what you're doing with your garden, um, but let's talk a little bit more about the exterior decor that you can have um, with your home. So joining me today, we have Matthew. He's from Sunset Valley Designs. Thank you so much for joining us, Matt. Uh, very, very, so let's talk about outdoor decor. So when we talk about, you know, big, we've been talking about these big builds and, you know, you know changing everything, but when it's all done, yeah. it still needs to be a little fancified. It needs to be a little zhuzhed. It does, yeah, <laughs> makes, it, makes it easier. Yes, yes, I'm not bougie, I promise. I just like, okay. like the word zhuzhed, so, <laughs> so there we go. So let's talk about what's trending in outdoor decor. It varies year to year. Okay. This is what we'd call a fence insert. Okay, so I'm gonna um, hold this up for everybody. Yep. So this is a fence insert. And they come in various sizes. Okay. And we also do deck screens as well, which are a little larger. Okay. And it's kind of trending that way towards gardening. Okay. So something like this, is this custom designed? Or, yes. Or, or you can buy a standard design? We can buy a file like that or custom make it. Okay. Yeah. So if you wanted to like incorporate your name or something in there, you exactly. can do something like that? Yeah. So these are inserted into the fence? Yeah. Into the fences themselves? And we give you three options of, an, of uh, fastening too as well. Okay. So to make it easier. Wonderful. So if someone gave you a picture of something that they wanted like that, that's something that you would be able to custom create for them? Yeah. And I'm asking, Matt, because I have a personal request. Okay, no problem. <laughs> and we're going to be talking after this. But no, I just, we wanted something to put on, on, up on the top of our fence that matched kind of what our neighbors had done. So yep. it kind of... It's cohesive. We can do that. Right? So what other types of things are trending? Anything from things like this to a name sign. Okay. Uh, to someone's car. Okay. Uh, we do a lot of classic cars. Okay. We'll take a picture of it, turn it into a DXF file, and cut it out. So they have their car. Awesome. It's not just a 1970 Chevelle. It's their 1970 Chevelle. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah. My husband would really like that because he had a 1971 Chevelle, but oh. we don't have it anymore. So. <laughs> No, we had kids. Oh, yeah, that happens. <laughs> Say bye-bye to the custom car at that point. But um, So you can use this all over the exterior. Yeah, you what, can. What type, I, I mean, I was looking around, and there's, I see there's always, and there has been for some time, um, a gnome trend. Yeah, we make gnomes. You make <laughs> we, gnomes. Do, we do. Everybody does, yeah. Right. Um, and we've probably got about 30 or 40 different styles. Okay. You can choose color, whichever you like. Well, that was my next question. So something like this, I mean, it looks stunning in black, but w would people do something like this in a color as well? Yeah, uh, we've actually done some two foot by four foot panels we shipped to California. She wanted a special color, so we had to get a powder coat of that color. Okay. Which was a little more expensive than black, but she enjoyed it. Right, right. So when people, um, so this can be out year round, obviously. Yep, these get coated with a zinc oxide primer. Okay. And then powder coated, so you've got two layers of protection. Okay. If you'd like, there's still a clear coat you can put on as well. Oh, okay. So, so it just kind of keeps it all, so it protects it, it from all it. the... Yeah, yeah, it seals it. Um, and is that something that you have to repeat over time? Shouldn't have to. You shouldn't that have should, to? That should be good for at least 10 years. Wow, okay. And then if someone just decides that, you know, the color pink is in, or the color red is in, they can, they can take re, it? Yeah, repowder coat it. Okay. That's awesome. Um, so they obviously don't rust them. Or they could rust? All metal rusts. All metal rusts. A 40-year-old car will rust. Right. This, with the protection it has, will last at least a 10 years. Okay. Same with fire pits. We don't powder coat them, but we use a high, high temperature paint. Okay. So it's good for a season. Next season, brush it off and repaint it. Okay. You're good to go. So fire pits are still in. Yep. Yeah. And yep. I'm, I'm thinking that they could probably have some amazing patterns to them. Anything you want. Yeah, we've done quite a few different ones. Okay. And they're actually right across the, the states and Canada. Okay, so and as you're saying, like after a year you would re protect Redo it, it again? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and is that something that they, somebody would do on their own or is that something, yeah? That's something they do on their own. Okay. You get a $18 <laughs> can of spray paint, high heat spray paint and just okay. redo it. 
So high heat is important, obviously, when we're talking about fire. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, we can't really powder coat them because it'll just melt. Right. Okay. So. Wonderful. Um, so let's talk about what a deck screen is. The deck screen would be a panel similar to this, anywhere from 18 to 24 to 48 by 48. Okay. We have done some 4 by 6. Right. Um, they get the same process with the zinc powder coating. Okay. And the clear coat and everything else. So they're they're used. They can be used as like a privacy wall a or do. just kind of like a decorative screen. Yeah. That sort of thing. Exactly. Um, is this something? See, I'm I'm already planning things at my house. <laughs> this has been a wonderful experience for me being here. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm my husband's gonna cringe when he goes when he sees it and sees all the things that the ideas I have for it. But I was thinking that this would be like, could you use this as like slats for a deck? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We've actually made panels for an outdoor shower stall. An outdoor shower stall. Yeah. See through? <laughs> a little bit. I'm not. I'm not. Okay, that's not one I'm trending towards. No. Is an out shower, but you could, yeah. shower stall. Okay, so you could just build, have your deck built, and then have these just installed. Just put it inside. Yep. And then, as see, I think that would be beautiful. Yeah. That would be wonderful. It's surprising the difference it makes. Yeah, it's just it would be unique too, especially if you had picked your own pattern. Exactly. Right. Just, okay, so I'm not going to hold you to any pricing here, um, but if we were talking about just doing like a privacy screen, yep. is there like a range of costs we would look at? It's usually around $45 a square foot. $45 roughly. a square foot, okay. Yeah, and that's, that's your design, proof, um, cut, powder coating, and okay. delivery. So are people using this type of metal decor inside their homes as well? Yes, they are. Okay. Um, sometimes we use a lighter gauge. Okay. Because it's nothing outside and something simple. Um, and that can be anything from a family name sign to whatever you want. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so you always see, I, like, you drive by these homes and you see these lovely signs that are, yeah. that are made. And I'm, I was always curious where, where one gets things like this. Right here. <laughs> <laughs> so, Matt, how did you get involved in doing this? Uh, I thought about doing it. We've been doing it for six years. We thought about doing it eight years earlier. Okay. And finally took the jump and did it. Okay. And have them look back. Wonderful. So it, was, it just seems a very specific jump. <laughs> yeah, it was a big jump. <laughs> just because, I mean, it's just like, you know, one day you're working in an office and the next day you're making these beautiful, yeah. uh, this beautiful outside metal decor and inside. I'm a welder by trade as well. Okay. And industrial mechanic. So this whole trend find, finds its way home. Wonderful. So. so we were just talking about with the guest prior the trades and how we need more kids in the trades and yep. that sort of thing. And I think that's just a prime example of how you start in one trade and then you move forward somewhere else yep, and then you exactly. move forward. And then one day you're owning your own business and you're making these lovely things for everybody. Yep. That's, yep. that's amazing. And sorry, how long did you say you've been doing this? Six years, actually. Six years? Yeah. Wonderful. So I've been missing a trend for about six years. Yeah. We actually <laughs> haven't done this show since 2019. Since then we went online and we're shipping worldwide now. Okay. So it's really grown. Amazing, amazing. So when somebody comes in and they don't know what they want, what, what kind of advice do you give them? What Kind of get a feel for what, where they're going to put something mm -hmm. and get an idea, give them some ideas that way. And we can just go from there. And we'll just go back and forth, give them some proofs. Okay. And they can say yes or no and go from there. Right. So, uh, and you had already said, so someone can just bring a picture. Like, have you done something as complicated as... I'm trying to think. What would be complicated? Um, like, so, like a picture of a, a person, like that, like, or would just be outlines, maybe? No, you'd see the any lines, facial lines, and everything else. Oh wow! Um, that's not really as difficult as we've got, but we've done a lot of difficult signs. Okay, well, let's so, talk about some of these difficult signs. What, what, what's um, been the most challenging for you? We did a sign for an egg place in Newmarket, which was a layered sign in all different colors. Okay. So it all had to be glued together with a special glue and everything else. And it looked stunning when it was done, but it was a lot of work. No doubt. Yeah. So how long does it, like the turnaround, like if you just wanted something, um, like you mentioned, a, a picture of your Chevelle that's done, how long is that process? Though? Two weeks. Like two weeks? Yep. That's impressive. Start to finish. Okay. Obviously more time for larger projects. Uh, about the same. Okay. Yeah. I push things out the door as fast as I can, but if it's if I don't like it, it's not leaving. Okay. Well, that's I'm good to know. Fussy. I fussy. Mean, yeah. You, you know what? I think there's something to be said for um, taking pride in what you do exactly. and, and giving people quality products for it. Yeah. There's a lot of people that don't have that kind of pride and they need it. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So if we were wanting to, um, like the deck thing is intriguing me. Okay. 
<laughs> so let's talk a little bit about building the deck and having these as the panels in the deck. Um, so something like that, obviously, you would be required to come out and measure and. I, I can either you, I can measure it or you can get your contractor to measure it and we can talk to him on the phone. There's a lot of different communications that way. Okay. And we've got about 270 different styles you can look through. That was my next question. There you go. <laughs> You're, we're connecting here, Matt. I'm feeling <laughs> a connection here for sure. Uh, the um, last two I did, the customer wanted to design himself, so we worked with him that way. Okay. So, and he was quite happy. Wonderful. So you've had people giving you like hand drawings and that sort of thing as yeah. well? Yeah. Giving us a picture and going, do something with this. And it's like, yeah, okay. So we, we figure it out. Wow. That's what we do best. Okay. So let's <laughs> talk a little bit about what type of machinery creates something like this. Uh, it's all CNC plasma. Okay. Uh, computer pneumatically controlled, basically CNC. And we do all the designing and everything else in-house. I do all the cutting and we ship it out for powder coating. I have a separate person that does that. Okay. And he does a really good job, and that's about it, really. Wow, okay. And I also obviously had welders and everything for putting tabs and anything else I need. Right, right. So, so your biggest project that you've ever done? Uh, a couple of deck screens were big. Okay. Um, some were 30 feet long. Wow. So you had to incorporate everything. It wasn't all the same pattern. So it was, it was challenging, but we got it done. So if we piqued an interest for anybody that's watching, you've got, you said, how many designs for them About to have a look at? 270 of deck screens only. Oh, okay. Yeah, like there's also fence inserts like this, or dogs, or cats, anything you want. Wow, so. okay. So this is way bigger than I ever thought it was. Like just, yeah. it's very, it's, as I said, I'm intrigued. Check um, out the website. <laughs> I definitely will, I definitely will. So, I'm just, I'm loving this particular design. This is, this is more like a tree? A tree of life, yeah. A lot of, of people like that. And oftentimes people just kind of come in and take well, from the, or do you have more people that do custom orders or do you have people that? We ship online actually. Okay. Um, people from California, you could say I want one of these at 16 by 16. And it's like, they give a deposit, we start cutting and it's out in two weeks. Wow. That is so interesting. I just, I'm, this, this intrigues me as much as tattoos. <laughs> have any but it does definitely intrigue me yeah, it's, um, it's, just with the, 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 the ability to customize these items it's whatever your mind you can think of and it's not strictly just to this you can do car parts you can do anything right and it's whatever your your mind can think of can come up with yeah right? that's impressive yeah even gnomes <laughs> even gnomes are there any other other than gnomes are there any other items that tre are trending right now just um even it's, on the interior? It's iffy, really. Um, it's up and down from year to year. Uh, a lot of custom name signs. Okay. People like that. Uh, and, the, and the fence screens and fence inserts. So um, are these, sometimes I see these, do they, they go above the fence or sometimes they're built into the fence? Built into the fence usually. Okay. Uh, we do some for the top of gates that are arched. Okay. Um, we sell a lot of those actually in the States okay. for some reason. So this is not something that, you know, that I don't, I just, I had never heard about it until we spoke. Okay. Um, but I think that this is, this is not something, if you want it done well, that you can just find anywhere. But there are other people that do it, mm -hmm. but just be cautious where you get it done. Right. And there's little times you can tell where they cut things out. If it's not done properly, there'll be a little ding in there where the plasma will come down and cut if it's not set right. Okay, and so you definitely want to look for quality. Exactly. For sure, for yep. sure. And do your research. Yep. And uh, thank you, Matt, so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. And we're going to go over to Jerry. I think he's talking to MPP Sylvia Jones. Hi there, Jerry Gould of the Lions Club again. I'm here with Sylvia Jones, Dufferin Caledon MPP. And Sy Sylvia, is, uh, she has a booth here and she's getting a lot of attention because of her wonderful personality. But we have a question for you, Sylvia. What about Headwaters Healthcare? So I'm actually really excited about some of the changes that we're seeing at Headwaters. Most notably, for the first time ever, Headwaters Healthcare Center is going to have an MRI. And it really means that people who have had to travel to Guelph, to, to Collingwood, to Barrie, are going to be able to get that MRI right here at Headwaters. And it's a really exciting change, Jerry, that I'm very proud that our government has done. And you know, Sylvie, uh, I have to plug the Lions Club here. Our TV, Rogers TV Bingo, we recently made a large donation to Headwaters Healthcare to help them buy a laser eye machine. 
Sylvie, if somebody wanted to find out a little bit more about what your government's doing in our area, how could they find that out? Well, this weekend, you can definitely visit me at the booth, but uh, you can always call my office, 519-941-7751. And I have incredible staff who can answer all of those questions and talk about some of the changes that are happening here in Dufferin Caledon. But more, if you have issues or concerns, then give my office a call and we'll work through those. Thanks again. Back to you, Tina. Thank you so much, Jerry, and thank you. Sylvia Jones for joining us today. Um, so we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about landscaping and construction. So there's a lot of things I think that fall into landscaping and joining me today we have Tim from Valley View Landscaping and Construction. Thank you so much for joining me Tim. Thanks for having me. It is my pleasure. So let's, okay, so when I think landscaping I just think someone's going to come in and make my garden look pretty. But let's talk about what the, the concept of landscaping entails, what, it, what the scope of it can, can be. It could be everything from, like you said, a few plants to a front walkway to a driveway to a complete new home, a deck, a pool house, a pool, trees, shrubs, everything. It's amazing. Nowadays, it's growing so big, right? So. Right, yeah. So, because like, I always just thought, you know, just from the start, you think, oh, it's landscaping. Someone's going to come in and mow your lawn and fix your plants. Yep. But it's a lot more than that, obviously. Um, so, what do you have to have a big property to look at having a landscaper come in? No, we've done everything from a townhouse, right, to people that live on 100 acres, right? So right. So it depends what you want and need, um, but the scale doesn't matter for property size. Okay, because there are, there are, like, I mean, there are people who have smaller homes that their landscaping is beautiful around yeah. their home, um, and you don't really think about somebody doing that for them, and then I'm always like, that person's really talented, but yeah. they probably have another talent behind them that's helping them do that, yeah. right? Yeah, a lot of times, right, they have a small place, but they want it to look nice mm -hmm. and be functional for a small area, and that's a harder sometimes in a big area, right? Mm -hmm. So, And somebody was telling me earlier that something that is trending right now is kind of building, like, outdoor living spaces, Yeah. right? So that's where someone, like a landscaper, could come in and kind of build around that property and really, like, whether it's putting into interlocking yeah. patio. Interlocking stone. Or, yeah. Interlocking stone. Yeah. See, I'm learning. I'm learning <laughs> as we go. Uh, but the interlocking stone and, and then having it, so we're talking about whether you want a privacy area, so landscapers take care of all those types of things? Everything from, we call it outdoor living spaces now, right? Mm -hmm. um, so anything to do with like an outdoor kitchen, sitting area, three season, four season, um, pools to hot tubs to jacuzzi, swimming tubs, right? That's a new big thing too now, right? And What's a swimming tub? It's like a super-sized hot tub. Super-sized hot tub. Um, okay. But so it's small, a pool, but smaller yeah. than a swimming pool, so you can fit it in the backyard of a townhouse or something okay. like that, right? So it's like 14, 15 feet long by the width of an eight foot. Um, and you have a swim, like a river to swim against that has jets for that, right? So okay. that's a that, new thing. That yep. sounds very cool. Yeah. See, I'm learning a lot of new things, <laughs> much to what I believe will be my husband's chagrin when he realizes like home. a moment, I yeah. get home and I'm like, did you know people do this? <laughs> we should do this. Um, but so when somebody's looking to have landscaping done, what should homeowners prepare for? What should they do to get started? Get some ideas is the main thing, because a lot of people don't have a clue what they want. They call you up and say, oh, I want a patio out here and they might be better off with a deck instead of a patio or a raised patio. Mm -hmm. They might need armor stone or a retaining wall around it. And then you have to think about lighting. Do you want lighting outside, all the other, there's so many different aspects to it, right? right. And it changes and changes every year, with new products and stuff. Right, so to, is there normally, if they don't have a plan, um, does a landscaper help create a plan, like a design? Is that something they do? Yeah, a lot of us do that, right? They'll make, some people want a full scale design, then you get a design person involved. Okay. The smaller projects, you can just sketch it out and sort of give them a good idea. I've been around for a long time doing it, so I have a lot of pictures, so I show them a lot of pictures, give them other ideas. Okay. And, oh, this is what I'm looking for. And because I've been around and people know it, they just, okay, this is what I want, make it. Right. <laughs> Create right. this for me, right? <laughs> so. so what has been your most challenging project? Uh, we did a massive retaining wall in the terracotta area. Okay. And the, we had to work into the side of the hill around the house, so trying to get equipment and machines in there, plus dealing with the escarpment, plus dealing with the green belt and all the other rules and wow. regulations. Okay. So those are not so much difficult as time consuming. It takes two to three years sometimes to get all the paperwork done. So Wow. Yeah, so landscaping sometimes is not just go in and do it. You have to get it approved <laughs> you because you're affecting watershed or this and that. Right? Okay, so. so let's talk. Can you, I, I know what it is because I have to get a small one done, but uh, what is a retaining wall? and what? Like, how retaining wall is a purpose for either holding back dirt 
or a garden, um, or if you're building a raised patio, so you have the retaining wall around the exterior of it, and then you put your stone inside it so it's two feet higher than your backyard or front yard or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's what a retaining wall, and you can do that natural stone or like a man-made stone. Okay. Yeah. So let's just say, for instance, you put a garden together for someone. Is this something where you would go back every, like, because obviously whatever you're planting is going to take time, like it's going to take grow. a few years to grow and really fill out the way that you envision it yeah. or, or the homeowner envisioned it happening. So is that something where you go back every year to take care of is, or is something that they take care of? Most of the time it's the homeowner's responsibility. Okay. There is companies out there that do the landscaping, but they're more of a property maintenance and they'll okay. look after the pruning and that. And the biggest thing we try to tell homeowners is not overplant because they'll want, oh, let's put in five shrubs. No, put in three shrubs because they'll grow into that space. Right. And you're not having to remove it and spend money, right? So. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you need the expert advice yeah. <laughs> to know what to put where, Guideline, that sort yeah. of thing. And then if they want to, they can slowly add, like even if they're adding like annuals to yeah. it to give it that pop of color or whatever it happens yeah. to be. Wonderful. So let's talk about interlocking stone. Um, so what when you're building something like that around a pool or around outside or creating a deck space um, is there a lot are there many different types of stone that you can use there is right now I would say there's hundreds Wow <laughs> there used okay. to be few when I started back in the 80s we had like four or five different styles of stone now you have every different style shape sizes they're getting bigger and bigger okay so they're not you know one hand person doing it a lot of it you do by machine now really a vacuum. Um, so they can weigh up to four or 500 pounds a piece and be four foot by four foot or down to like a 12 by four inch. Wow. So, yeah. Crazy. I was, I it would never think, yeah. <laughs> that's a lot, that's a big stone that yeah. you're talking about moving yeah. around. And so is interlocking stones like in a pattern, is that the most difficult thing to kind of put together? Not too bad because they all have a pattern. So once you get the pattern going, it goes quite quickly. Um, and the, they call it interlock, they should call it just paving stones because okay. it doesn't interlock anymore. Now okay. they just sort of hook together, or sit side by side. Um, before they were all grooved and they hooked in more together. So, oh, okay. See, I'm yeah, learning it's lots. all changed. Yeah. Wonderful. So when you're doing something like that, um, I mean, obviously you want it built so that it lasts a considerable amount of time, but is that some, is there like a lifespan on like the, the stone? The, most of the stones guaranteed for life nowadays, the way okay. they manufacture it. The job itself should last a lifetime and it all goes again properly installed, the base and all those things. But it should last you a lifetime. I've seen interlocking stone that's been down for 30 years and it might have faded or chipped a bit, but it's still solid. So. Okay, so if something like something something happens, um, and you've built like this um, stone deck, whatever it happens to be, they drop something on it, they break things. Are, are you able to replace a section of it, or is that something where you have to kind of redo more of it? Ninety percent of the time, you can replace what's damaged. Sometimes it'll be different color because when you run a different batch, the colors are a little off. Right. So you try to do is move one from an area that's not going to be as noticeable and switch it in and make it work. Okay, so and we're saying that these last a lifetime, but you know, hopefully nothing like that happens <laughs> and, and you're not called back to do it. But it, like taking care of something like that, is, is there a specific way to take care of the stone when you're building a deck or around a pool? The stone itself, a lot of people, you can either keep it clean with uh, different chemicals. Okay. Most of them are environmentally friendly now. And then a sealer, you can put a sealer on there so it gives you a wet look, it keeps okay. the weeds from growing and keeps the stone face looking proper. Okay, so do you do wood decks as well? We do wood decks. Okay, yep. and what kind of care do you have to give to a wood deck? Because that's something that fades and doesn't look very nice after a while. And besides maintaining it with the sealer, again, I would go with a clear coating mm -hmm. because as soon as you start putting different colors on, it seems not to last very long. Okay. And then you gotta sand it and reseal it again, right? But a clear coat. And it'll, again, wood pressure treat is supposed to last, they call it a lifetime of 20 years. You should be able to get 30 years out of it. Right. But it depends on, again, where, you know, sunshine on it, moisture, wet areas, treat in, things like that. Okay, so like power washing it and that sort of thing yeah. and keeping it clean is a yeah. good idea. Yeah, and when you power wash it, don't overpower wash it because you'll feather it. Right. And then it's no good. Yeah. <laughs> then you've lifted the deck and now you yeah. get, have to get a new one, right? Yeah. So when you're working with, like, when you're planning out like a garden or you're working with somebody for a garden, um, how is it challenging to kind of work with, you know, when things are blooming and what, like how, do you take all that into consideration? Like if somebody wants a garden that is beautiful and colorful, colorful year round? Yeah, um, to try to do is most gardening is best to do either early spring or early fall besides your annuals you're planting. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to do that as, 
early spring, late fall. That way they root themselves properly and then picking the variety of colors because everything has a different time. So some will be early spring, summer, late summer, fall colors. So you want to have that mix go through the whole garden so you have color all year round, right? Because nothing stays all summer except for your annual stuff. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. And sometimes with me, they don't stay year round. <laughs> <laughs> need water. Yeah. <laughs> they do. So yeah. let's talk about that. So I've had my house beautifully landscaped and I have a beautiful garden. How often should we be watering the garden and how, like, what else should we be doing to make sure it's maintained and, and everything is growing in a healthy way? Most gardens most lawns you're all right if it rains once a week if it doesn't give it 15 20 minutes in the morning right before the Sun comes on it and let it soak in okay but you don't have to overly water because you overly water they just get lazy and they don't root properly okay so that plants can be lazy yep see I learned something else new <laughs> <laughs> so by overwatering it they get lazy yeah because they don't have to root themselves in so they point upwards to get the water because it's above them right so oh, okay yeah. see I'm learning a lot today there you go. <laughs> in lots of different ways. So how long have you been doing this, Tim? I've been doing this my whole life, but I've been in business for myself for 31 years. So. Wow, good for you. Yeah. And, and you're still loving it, obviously. Still loving it, and both my boys work with me, so that helps, right? I'm getting a little older and wore out, but <laughs> most of it now we do with machine too, right? So right. a lot of it originally was hand work. So. Yeah, like I, I've seen some beautiful gardens in my day, and I'm just like, that's a lot of work, and yeah. that's just so not me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why people like low-maintenance gardens, right? Mm -hmm. So you keep it with perennials and you get your nice shrubbery and stuff like that to keep it simple mulch it up right so you don't have to worry too much about water weeds things like that right so mulching is recommended and there's different yeah. colors of mulch and that sort of thing now right yeah it used to only be like a brown yeah color. it used to be like a, just a cedar mulch and right. now you can get all the different colors i always suggest the cedar mulch because it's natural and it doesn't discolor like the other stuff will fade the same as anything that's painted right so right right like the black mulch the black or the thing. red yeah, yeah it all fades off and you gotta keep it up every year where if you put a good mulch on it, it should be good for two or three years so for, let, and I'm not going to hold you this because yep. there's many, many different types of um, projects and, and time that it takes, but just working on someone's like front garden, just kind of doing the type of reno, is it, how long does it normally take for landscaping to be done? Smaller property, you use your in and out in a few hours, two or three hours. Um, if it's a larger property, you can spend a week there, right? Um, mm -hmm. But most places, a lot of it, if it's there, it just needs to be maintained. It's a, you know, half day job sort of thing like that. Okay. So obviously budget's very important as yep. well when you're when you're thinking about a project yeah budget is one of the biggest things because without money you can't do anything right so right. Um, a lot of times that's the first question I ask people you know you want this but what sort of budget you're looking at and that way you can also figure out what you can do for them right and let them know okay you can't have the Cadillac but you can have a Corvette or you know in Absolutely. between right wonderful yeah. Tim I want to thank you so much for joining me you're welcome thank you for having me and we're going back over to Jerry Hi there, Jerry Gould of the Lions Club. Tonight, uh, I'm standing here with Yasmin Slater. She's a friend of Island Lake. You know, Island Lake is one of the jewels of Mono and Dufferin County. Yasmin's here on her booth, and she's talking about an upcoming Bass Pro. Over to you, Yasmin. Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we're uh, marketing our, or promoting our 13th annual uh, Bass Derby a catch and release tournament that we host at Island Lake Conservation Area and it's one of our big fundraisers for the year. Um, so we have 300 spots available, um, the cash prizes, so it's a great, um, a little extra cash in your pocket at the end of the weekend if you're the big catch. This year uh, the big catch prize is $5,000 um, and it's July 15th and 16th. And the prices, we have adult categories, so it's $50 per day, $80 for two days. And we also have a youth category too, which is $10 a day. So kids can come out and participate with their family as well. It can be a family event. Well, also it attracts a lot of people to Dufferin County that particular weekend. I have a question for you. My son always asks, what is, you may know this, I hope you do, what is the <laughs> largest bass ever caught there? So we have on record over five pounds for our derby, yeah. That is pretty incredible. Yeah. Thanks, Yasmin. No problem. Back to you, Tina. Thanks so much, Jerry, and boy, do we ever love the Credit Valley Conservation. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about the inside now. We just did an outdoor segment. We're going to talk a little about the inside, and we're going to get a really, really specific about flooring and carpeting um, with Dan from Celtic Carpet. Thank you so much for joining me. No problem. Thank you. So let's talk about, see, it, it, I'm intrigued with the, the carpet. Just I always thought 
carpet was kind of moving towards out of style. Is it still in style? Is it still trending carpet? We sell carpet an awful lot. Okay. Uh, carpet is great uh, and we see it go in mostly with um, uh, private areas. Right. So bedrooms uh, and stairs. Uh, stairs are uh, a good way to you know feature a staircase. Mm -hmm. uh, hardwood stairs can be a little bit slippery so they provide a little bit of traction. And a nice decorative carpet can provide a, a nice pop to a staircase. Well, it's good to know that it's still a popular option because yeah. you see all these, and we're going to talk about flooring too, but we yeah. see all these new flooring options and things that are happening. Um, but I just wasn't sure, like, and I'm, area rugs. Let's go to area rugs. Yeah. Are they still like? Uh, we sell an awful lot of area <laughs> rugs. So uh, area rugs are, you know, how we do it is we don't have prescribed area rugs that are available. Okay. The typical Persian rugs and, and things like that. What we have is whatever we sell on the rack. So we, uh, the, it's nice because it's versatile for the customer. Okay. They can order, they can pick a style, they can pick a color, however they want to do it. And we order the carpet in cut and bind it to their specification. So if they want something very specific, circular, octagonal, okay. rectangular, uh, for whatever size, um, we're able to accommodate that, bind it, and um, it's, uh, it usually makes people quite happy. Okay, so how do you decide, if you're looking at your room, you've got a rectangular shaped basic room, yep. how do you decide what is the best size area rug and I'm asking you this question because I ordered some area rugs, I brought them in my house, yeah. and I was like, these don't look right. And right. when I realized it was the size, how do you decide what works best for a room? Right, so what you wanna do, what I encourage a lot of people to do is sort of tape things out. Okay. You know, get a little masking tape and put it down and see where you wanna orient things. Okay. Um, so it's all about setting up your room the way you want it. I always like to see either all of or part of the furniture on the area rug okay. to sort of bring a nice cozy atmosphere to it, right? right. You're, creating, you're creating a space. Right. And so that's how, that's how most people do things. Okay, and I would think too, um, when we're, you're looking at your room, it's the size of your room for, and like the shape of your room. Because what I did, I have a rectangular living room. Mm -hmm. I brought in a round carpet, yep. thinking this is gonna be great. It's gonna cover the spot number one that I wanted it to cover and kind of bring it all in, but it, it didn't work for me. <laughs> well, <laughs> we live and we learn, right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, so when you're looking at, like if I had a bigger room, it might have worked well. Like, for a section to kind of tie in a section together or something like that. Exactly. But you kind of have to really look at, this is what I've learned, maybe not everybody else, but yeah. you really need to look at kind of the size and the shape of your room and what, like as you said, kind of where you want to do and, and how you want to tie everything in. Exactly. Right? So my, my living room wasn't that big, but at the same time, the round looked awkward. Yeah. <laughs> well, every room has a purpose. Mm -hmm. and, and and so in, in keeping that purpose in mind, um, that's how you sort of decorate around the room with area rugs it's just a matter of if it's a conversational room create a conversation area right and you, your rug will um will sort of follow that and just a side note i went with a rectangular one okay <laughs> and it went great so there you go <laughs> so is there uh, is there something trending in carpets like colors shapes patterns because it, it used to be you know, back in, and I'm going to say olden days, because yeah. I'm, I'm just going to age myself, okay. the carpets that my parents had, yeah. they were all very floral and very, you know, deep gold colors and things like right. that. Like, what's trending now for so carpets? You, patterns are trending, right? Okay. Um, so there's a, there's a few ways to do uh, patterns, okay. right? There's, um, and it's, it's all about manufacturing and color. So you can get monotone, um, with what we call like a cut and loop, okay. which would be a mixture of cut pile carpet with loops. So, so a looped carpet is a Berber. Okay. Um, and some will have like characteristics of both. Okay. So you have, and that that's how they create patterns and design within that. So we do sell a lot of, uh, and especially with the airy rugs, but mm -hmm. stairs, bedrooms, we're selling a lot of um, pattern carpet, textured carpet. Okay. And um, right. and you can achieve that through through just the different types of manufacturing. And are there any colors that are trending, or is it just basically specific to the person? You know, home? it's I, I always colors uh, and flooring aren't always. You know, how many people tore dusty rolls out of their house, right? Right. I mean, it's just uh, it's fun to have color. Uh, area rugs are great for color. Right. But um, you want to sort of play to um, 
uh, you know, longevity. You want to have, you want to be able to have longevity out of your flooring, whether mm -hmm. it be hardwood, whether it be carpet. Um, and so, uh, you know, natural and uh, easy colors to decorate around. Okay. Um, you know, flooring is a foundational piece. Mm -hmm. um, that's the way I look at it. Right. Uh, and it's a foundational piece. You'll you'll paint your walls probably three times before you change, change your, your floors. Carpet, right. Right. So keep that in mind. Yeah. So uh, yeah, and you know you're absolutely right because a lot a lot with the textured carpets. Like I have a textured carpet in my area rug, mm -hmm. um, and I got my accent color which was red, and there was just spots of red that are that textured piece. But it's so many other colors to it. Like not so many, but. You can tie, you can reuse, you can keep it even though if you're changing your paint exactly. or your furniture. Exactly, exactly. Right? So what's the most durable type of carpet? Like if you're, if you've got young kids and dogs and crazy things happening in your home, what's the most durable type of carpet that you can get? Okay, so the most durable type of carpet you can get is a synthetic fiber. Um, typically we, we look at um, man-made fibers, Triexta being one, uh, also known as smart strand and also um, nylons, okay? okay? So a lot of people will know nylon, stain master nylon, all that kind of stuff. Um, and they have been around for years. Uh, very hardy, very durable. Um, the Triexa has everything. So it's hardy, durable, soft, stain resistant. It's got everything. Okay. Um, the nylon's really good at being durable and uh, giving you that longevity. Um, polyester has come a long, long way, oh. and um, polyester is sort of that affordability factor. Okay? okay. So it's very, very cleanable. It's very, uh, it's it's quite durable. Not as durable as these other man-made fibers, mm -hmm. but um, still can hold up really quite well. And um, if you're on a budget and you want something like, I mean, solution-dyed products, man-made products are the sort of um, that's where you want to be because you can take harsh chemicals to it and it doesn't take the color out of it because the color is inherent in the fiber. Okay, wonderful. Well, I, I want to make sure we have a chance to talk about flooring. Sure. So what's trending in flooring right now? Uh, well, hardwood is never going to go out of style. It's I timeless, hardwood, right? Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, you just never, it, it, it's never going to go anywhere. It's really, really nice. It's warm, it's comfortable. Um, it can scratch, um, it will scratch, mm -hmm. let's put it that way, it will scratch. Um, you just have to, uh, there's ways uh, that you can sort of mitigate some of those, um, uh, you know, glaring uh, errors right. that may happen to your floor. So, right. uh, but yeah, hardwood will always be number one. And you can cover it with an area rug. You can cover it with an area rug. <laughs> Um, Multi-purpose. I, I say that a lot, um, but yeah, so that's good. And then you know, vinyl plank, uh, luxury vinyl plank, engineered luxury vinyl plank. You know, a very close second. Okay. Right? All right. So, how important is the color of a floor to the overall feel of a room? So uh, again, I, I, I'm going to go back to what we talked about with carpet. Um, you know, flooring is a foundational piece, and so you want to you want to make sure you. Um, you, 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 you generally have a theme going right. when you're decorating a room, mm -hmm. right? But Rome wasn't built in a day. And a lot of people like to do things over time. It's, it's all fun to do a huge renovation and then walk in and say, okay, that's done. But that doesn't always happen. Right. So I would say what the best thing to do is just sort of take, take your time, think about the colors that you want to do, the tones, the mood that you want to set. And... Um, and, and go with that. You can go dark mm -hmm. with light walls. You can go light with dark walls. There's all sorts of different combinations. And I think too, like I think just talking to somebody because I think when you take something like a gray floor mm -hmm. can be very cold, yeah. but sometimes you have a gray floor with like a brownish undertone kind of yeah. to it, which warms up the room considerably. So yeah. you really have to look at like what you were saying, like what, what kind of feel do you want for the room, you know, and then look at what kind of colors can bring that in. And then in my opinion, yeah. um, you know, always picking a color that you can paint your room four times exactly. and you don't have to worry about the color of your exactly. floor. Exactly. When I moved into my house, we had ceramic tile. Uh -huh. This is not as hideous as it sounds, but uh -huh. it was almost like a salmon color. Okay. So I had a pink floor. 
um, throughout my entire house except for the hardwood in certain rooms. Okay. Um, and man, did that make it a challenge. Yeah, it is tough to <laughs> decorate When you're talking around. to like, what color do you want to have your walls? You have a pink floor. Like, yep. you, you know, <laughs> it just doesn't always match. So it's always good to have that, the idea of what you want to. Yeah. What, what well, and I think the key is, is decorate for yourself first. Right. Right? Decorate to your tastes. Yeah. Unless you're thinking of moving. Well, let me tell you, <laughs> that pink floor came out this year or yeah. last year, yeah. and I'm the happiest homeowner oh, you've ever Good had. For you. you finally now I can paint my walls any color I want because I picked the perfect color floor. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about flooring. What is the best type of flooring um, if you want it like scratch proof and waterproof? Yeah. So laminates and um, and 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 like in vinyl planks, they really sort of excel in that department, okay. right? Anything can scratch. Like, you just have to expect it. It's like when you get a car, the first ding, you know, then it's, it's over and you're okay, right? <laughs> right. Same with floors. Right. It's, it's, it's going to scratch. You just, you have to be sensible in mm -hmm. how you move things around and, and so on and so forth. Um, if you, you know, if uh, laminates and, 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 and vinyl planks are going to do really, really well okay. long term. Wonderful. Yep. Wonderful. I want to thank you, Dan, for joining me so much today. No problem. And we're going to go over to Jerry to see who he's got with him. Hi there, Jerry Gould again of the Orangeville Lions Club. I'm here with my friend and fellow Lions Club member, Frank Gray. Frank Gray may be one of the hardest working Lions in our whole uh, group. Frank Gray is also here to talk about our Lions and Rogers TV bingo that we do on Tuesday nights. Frank actually spearheaded, one of the guys that spearheaded this whole new venture for us. So Frank, tell us a little bit about what we do and where the money goes. Well, we uh, support the hospital, we support the women's center, and uh, all the money that we raise is uh, spent in the community. And we have a lot of fun making the money too. We, we're all volunteers. And uh, some of us have been in a uh, lot longer than others, but we, we have a, a 45 member membership, and uh, we have a lot of fun raising this money, and we sure enjoy working with Rogers because they've they've really made our day. This TV bingo is really uh, really uh, working for us, and we're cer cer certainly getting along well with Rogers. They've been great to work with, and uh, like I say, uh, some of us uh, I've been a member for 55 years. Uh, but people come and people go, but we have a very, very strong Lions Club. And like I say, we spend all the money in the, in the community that we raise it out of. And we have a lot of supporters here. When they know the Lions Club is doing a project, they know that the money is going to be spent in the community and they, we get a lot of support that way. So uh, I don't know. Uh, we're very, very fortunate. Orangeville has been good to us. And I guess we've been good to Orangeville too because we spend uh, thousands of dollars uh, every year that we raise in the community and people remember that. So when we're doing something like the TV bingo, Rogers TV bingo, they know that uh, when they buy tickets, the profit we make is going back into the community. Our membership, we get paid nothing. We're all volunteers. We get nothing for our efforts, but a lot of uh, thanks on the side. Well, thanks, Frank. And, you know, uh, if you're at the, at the Home and Garden Show this weekend, as you enter the front doors, the Lions Club is there. We're there hoping to recruit new members. Should you like what you see between Frank and I and, and 45 other uh, members, we are proud to serve the Lions. We're proud to serve our community. And we are selling bingo tickets. Imagine that. So back to you, Tina. So much Jerry so one of the things I think that everybody aspires to when they're working on their home when you're just or whether you're just you know can't wait until the summer gets here and I know we had snow today and I'm bringing it up again but it's gonna go away I promise one of the things people aspire to or what I know my husband aspires to and many people in my uh, neighborhood is a beautiful green lawn and how to achieve that beautiful green lawn. Joining me today we have Richard Reed from Dufferin Lawn Life and I said it because Dufferin Life and Dufferin Lawn Life you can't get it wrong. No. Richard thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. So let's talk let's talk about right off the bat why is having a green lawn important? Um, first of all uh, turf grass is the densest plant in an urban environment so there are millions of plants on a lawn. Okay. And the average lawn would create enough oxygen for a family of four. Oh, okay. It, it reduces sound, it reduces uh, 
uh, it filters water. Um, so it's kind of undervalued because like on a hot day, if you stand on an asphalt driveway, then go stand on a lawn, then go stand on a lawn under a tree, you can see how much cooler it is. Right. And, um, you know, it's an important plant. It is, it is. And providing oxygen is very important for all of us. <laughs> it's a place for our kids to play. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So now, I was going to say now that winter's over, but as we already discussed, <laughs> the, the winter came at us again today. But when winter is over, what's the first thing we should do to prepare our lawns for the, for the good weather? Um, Everyone gets kind of anxious when spring arrives. They're, they're so glad to be outside again. I just ask them to be a little bit patient. Um, uh, you don't want to start raking in that when, the, when it's still too mushy and wet. Okay. Um, one of the things we get more and more now with, um, you know, our snow plows are doing the sidewalks, so a lot of times there's a lot of debris, mm -hmm. and you need to get rid of that. Okay. And. Um, uh, rake the sand and salt off because the salt will damage uh, the edge of, of the turf, especially on the boulevard. Okay. And um, I would apply, um, you know, something like gypsum to neutralize the salt if you have a lot there. Okay. And, um, and then seed it. Okay, so we want to wait until the ground is a little bit more firm, not too mushy. Right. And then we start to rake. And right. Then, um, and then we, we take it from there. Um, so, what do we, so the winter's over, we have now raked our lawn. Right. What, what do we do next? Normally you would apply a fertilizer. Okay. Um, you would apply, um, you see the three numbers are, are, stand for NPK. Basically nitrogen, the first number is the highest number that, uh, for turf. Okay. Uh, that provides a lot of growth. And the second number would be P. Uh, uh, phosphorus, which is more for rooting, okay. and the third number is K, which is potash, general health of the plant and re uh, reduces disease. Okay. So those are generally, when you buy a bag of fertilizer, those are the three numbers you, you will see. Uh, most turf grass doesn't really need a lot of the middle number, okay. um, or any at all. Um, because uh, if it's a little bit low in phosphorus, it will actually go look for it. And if okay. the roots are are trying to um, find it, but actually you'll get deeper rooting. Um, so, uh, you know, the other thing you can do is add compost or uh, an organic fertilizer. Um, and, um, you know, the, um, you can also, if you really want to get specific, you can do a soil test and ch check for micronutrients. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's so funny, and it's not funny, but it is funny that, because you often think of your... <laughs> funny ha-ha? Ha. Funny ha-ha. No, so when I'm thinking of my garden, you think of all the plants and everything that's going on. Correct. Um, and then you don't realize that what you have in front of your home or around your home is one big, large set of plant like there's plants Eco everywhere ecosystem ecosystem yeah so because you don't even think about that unless you're looking for that beautiful lush green lawn which many people are and then there's others mm -hmm. that you know they're happy with just doing the the, the status quo and, and keeping their lawn well, going i think if people realize the importance of lawns they are a little bit underrated we all value our trees mm -hmm. and uh you know all heck breaks loose if someone chops a tree down. Right. But uh, we don't realize, you know, how important turf grass is. Yeah, absolutely. So when do we start mowing? So we've, we've fertilized, we've raked, when do we start mowing? Generally speaking, in a normal year, whatever that is nowadays, <laughs> it would be the first uh, of May. Okay. Um, when the, you, you never want to cut more than a third of the plant off at a time. Okay. So if it gets, you know, if you're keeping your lawn at two to three inches in height, then uh, when it gets up to, uh, you know, two and a half, three inches, then you cut it, usually okay. once a week, but sometimes early in the year, you might have to do it twice a week. Okay, and that really, because it will depend too on the weather, like if we get lots of rain, the grass grows a little bit more, right? Um, and then you have to, to mow a little bit more often. Yeah, it's got all this built up energy over the winter and it's ready to go when the spring comes, just like us. And uh, so you do want to um, uh, keep it mowed perhaps twice a week because it's important to leave the clippings on if possible. Oh, okay. That's free fertilizer for you. Uh, it could be as much as one application of fertilizer a year uh, in the clippings. Okay. So, but if it gets too heavy, then you will have to 
uh, remove the clippings. Okay. How often should we water our lawns? Hmm. Well, our of course, dependent on weather. Right. So generally speaking, in the spring, you don't have to. Okay. Um, we start getting into June and July, and we get into a droughty period. If if a lawn goes um, 60 days without water, it will die. Okay. So uh, if you want to maintain it to be healthy, you need to water it once a week. Okay. And if you want to keep it green in the hot weather, it may require twice a week. Okay. And so is that why the grass will turn like a yellow or start to turn brown, well, that's green, a, or yet like light green that's, to yellow? Yes. So uh, the lack of water? That's its own protection. Okay. So it, it is taking the moisture out of the leaf and putting it into the root, and that's a defense mechanism to preserve uh, to preserve the plant itself. Okay. So, so you, you don't want to let it go in and out of dormancy. If you're a person that's deciding, I don't mind a brown lawn in the middle of the summer, then water it once a week. If you uh, need to have a green lawn all summer long, then you will have to water at least a couple times a week uh, in, in that severe hot weather. Okay, so if, we, if our lawn is brown, because sometimes there's you know droughts and that and we can't water our lawns, we're told by the town we can't water our lawns, right. the lawn starts to go brown, right. we can bring it back? most of the time? Hopefully. Yeah, I mean, I, since uh, the town put uh, meters in, uh, we haven't really had water bans. Because mm -hmm. um, now water gets kind of expensive, so you don't want to waste it. But, so you, you will be able to likely water it at least once a week to keep it alive. Okay, okay. So what is aerating a lawn? What does that mean? What does it do? Well, aerating, um, the, generally speaking, is a uh, what people are referring to is a core aerator that punches uh, many holes in the lawn, usually about two and a half inches deep. Okay. And it brings a core up. It helps break up the thatch and uh, gets more air and water and fertilizer down to the roots. Okay. And uh, increases ox oxygen in the root zone, which uh, uh, we shouldn't think of soil as being uh, lifeless. Soil is a living thing. Okay. So it's full of microorganisms, so by aerating you're increasing those microorganisms. Um, yeah, and there's some new products out there, the uh, liquid uh, aeration that mm -hmm. has, um, uh, has a combination of some organics and some uh, actually probiotics in it to add more okay. microorganisms into the soil. How often should we fertilize our lawns in one summer? Like, mm. is that something that you're doing constantly? Uh, that's a very um, broad question, but um, uh, if you're using a quick release fertilizer, you would probably have to do it four or five times lightly. Okay. If you're using a slow release, a normal slow release, which is about six to eight week release, usually has a coating on it, and which slows down the release of the fertilizer, and then would water. Uh, it, dissolves the coating okay. um, that that um, nutrients will be released but uh, I know like with our company we've gone to 120 day so a very slow release so mm -hmm. we only would need to do that twice a year and, and then top it up so you can top it up with foliar the, the thing that I like about liquid fertilizer it doesn't it doesn't uh, require as much energy uh, for the plant to break it down and, and create a nutrient from that. Okay, so I've got a quick question because we've got a, just a little under a minute before we go. But if we're fertilizing or seeding our lawn, um, should we do that when we know it's not going to rain or should we be trying to plant it when it rains? Um, the, the best time to seed a lawn is between August 15th and September 15th. Okay. The second best time is the spring. But the problem I have in the spring sometimes is you'll seed it, it'll come up gangbusters, but then you'll get that heat spell in uh, July and it hasn't developed a strong enough root system to withstand that. Oh, okay. So when you seed in August, uh, it comes up well because you tend to, the days are shorter, it's cooler, and it has from then until next July to develop a strong root system to avoid uh, getting killed by drought. Wonderful. Richard, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. All right. Thank you. And we're going back over to Jerry. Hi, Jerry Gould again of the Orangeville Lions Club. I'm actually sitting here with uh, Vanessa. We're not, we're not sitting down We're not at all. sitting. So 
I knew this would be the up. most fun. So <laughs> Vanessa is with Lavender Blue. Now I want to say one thing. This Lions Club Home and Garden Show, it's a huge effort. And we have 45 members, we volunteer, we get this all set up to go. But Vanessa and her company have taken an awful lot off our plate and freed up many Lions uh, Club hours. She takes care of the kitchen and her menu is spectacular. Tell us a little bit about that, Vanessa. Well, hi, Jerry, thanks. So I think it's lovely that you think that we're taking so much off your plate, which I appreciate you saying. Uh, we just feel like, so Terry and I, you know, when we got talking, we thought as the lion's top tier starts to get a little, starts to age a little bit. It's harder for everybody to uh, do the jobs at once they did do. And because the Lions do so much in our community, it's really important for us to make sure that the home show that raises a lot of money for our community is taken care of. So we can't have a home show without food or something for you to eat here. So Lavender Blue's taking care of that. Uh, my team is awesome. Uh, my business partner, Terry, has been slaving away in the kitchen for a week, making all good stuff for you. Uh, so, so come on out and try it. Yep. I would encourage you to come on out to the home show. The home show has lots and lots of great vendors, and we're just one of them. So, yeah, it's very exciting. So I also just wanted to talk about, Jerry's encouraging me uh, to talk about, we have an initiative called Stir the Pot. It's new. It used to be called Soup Sisters, and we were affiliated with a group that started in Alberta, but they're not started up yet because of COVID. So we're gonna, we are started our own group. So stir the pot, it's every last Monday of the month, except for July and August. And it runs from 6.30 to nine at night. You come, you chop, you eat soup, you put the soup in a container and the soup goes to Family Transition Place. And if they're full, it goes to the food bank or Choices or a new men's shelter, um, our soup kitchen, which is the lighthouse on Broadway. So it's a really good, fun time. You come and hang out with me and of course Terry, because she's actually do, does the cooking. <laughs> so you know, I'm just the fun time. Well, she can be fun too, I think, but shh, don't tell her I said that. <laughs> Thanks, Vanessa. You know, I, I got to say, I've had her soup, Terry's soup, Vanessa's soup. It is fantastic. Thanks again, Vanessa, no for helping us at the Lions Club. Thanks for having us. We appreciate it. Back to you, Tina. Thank you so much, Jerry, and thank you, Vanessa. Both Vanessa and Terry are very fun. So whatever Vanessa says, you just you just remember that Terry's lots of fun too. They're an adorable couple uh, of people that love to make soup um, to help others. Um, so let's get into talking about painting. We're going to talk about exterior painting. We're going to talk about interior painting. Joining me today, we have Moria, Morris from Moe's Painting. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Uh, so let's start off by talking about interior painting. Um, what colors are trending now? So I'd say grays, like blue grays. Right. Um, black and white. Really? Mm -hmm. So people are painting things Inter like interior black or exterior? Uh, exterior black. Okay. Interior blue grays. Okay. Like um, Benjamin Moore's color of the year is uh, strawberry blush or something like that. Okay. Um, Sherwin Williams will have their own. But what I see like over the years, last five, ten years, is blue grays, um, interior and exterior. In fact, um, brick companies are actually making brick in these colors. Oh, really? Yeah. Because, because, yeah. um, the younger people, they don't, they don't really go for that red, clay, brick, brown. They want to um, make it contemporary. Yeah, and, and, and it's, it's classic almost too, like to, take, to pick a color like a gray, because you know it's not, it's not the, exactly. the in style. Like, you know, some people get some crazy things done to the exterior of a house and paint doors crazy colors, and it's something that, you know, is in style for a while, but something that you may have to change moving forward. Yeah, because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking um, 10, 15, 20 years from now, um, all these gray, that, that's what's going to date us yeah. when, it, when, it, when the trend, trends change. So it, it's going to flip around again. It, it always does. It always does. We, th that's why they're trends. They trend for a while and then we go into something new. Yeah. So let's talk about, like when we're talking about grays, you're saying it's a blue gray because there are other grays that have like a, or what they're calling now grayish, which is like a beige gray. Okay. Um, and I heard that that's kind of popular now too. But when you're picking a paint color for your room, what do you have to take into consideration? Well, your floor, um, your, your, your floors, let's say you have hardwood floors or tiles, mm -hmm. they're not gonna go anytime soon. So you go off, uh, you play off that. Okay. What's prominent, work with that. Wonderful. So back in the day, 
and I say back in the day because I'm, I'm, I'm aging myself here again, you always had to prime your walls before you painted them. Is that still something that happens? I mean, I know there's some paints that combine it, but is that something that people do? I'd say yes and no. And in certain circumstances, you, you, you should prime. Like if you're going from a, um, a dark color to a very light, you would prime just to get the coverage. Okay. If you're doing new construction, new drywall, um, you have to prime. You have to prime. Yeah, because you've got to seal the drywall. Okay. Um, but if the colors, if the shades are close, um, you don't have to prime. Okay. So let's talk about ceilings. They are my nemesis. I do not like to paint ceilings. <laughs> Boris, you got to help me. So do you, like, if you've got a stucco ceiling, which are, is not popular anymore, and you can't, maybe you don't have it in your budget to replace your ceiling, mm -hmm. um, you have to use a special paint for stucco ceilings and ceiling paint? Okay, well, if you, if you have stucco that's never been, never been painted before, I call it virgin stucco. Okay. You treat it just like plaster drywall. It has to be sealed. Okay. Um, in that case, I would use an, an oil product because uh, a water-based product will soften it. It will tend to want to come off in, in sheets. Yes. So you seal it with an oil product. That's what I do. So what happens, I'm using, I'm going for your expertise here. So mm -hmm. somebody had a stucco ceiling and by accident they used a water-based paint. Mm -hmm. It's starting to scrape and come off. Is it easier just to put drywall up or is there any way to save it? Okay, matching, tex matching textures and patterns, that's a whole different, that's a whole skill. Okay. Like a lot of guys do it. Like I have a little hopper, I'll, sh I'll shoot it, but uh, I never guarantee it. Okay. I never guarantee it. And um, scraping it off is an, is an option. If yeah. It, if it hasn't been painted before, like I said, you saturate water, it comes off pretty easy. Mm -hmm. But what you got to be careful of is uh, asbestos. Okay. That's an issue. If your house was built pre-1970, you, you can assume there's asbestos in there. Okay, so maybe better just to not open it up and put something on it or just take it out uh, completely? New, yeah, you're saying like new drywall? Mm -hmm. You can have you can have um, remediation where you okay. have asbestos uh, technicians come in okay. and they'll encapsulate it and that's a, it's expensive. Okay. Okay, like when you, when you put new drywall, um, you, have, you have to be careful not to damage it because disturbing it, okay, that's what the, exposes it, exposes right. you. Right. So even putting new drywall, you got to screw into it, you have to cut. Um, you're exposing the, the right. operator, myself, mm -hmm. and your family potentially to uh, carcinogens, you know. Yeah, you, we, we want to stay away from that for sure. Yeah. So what is the best time, if we're, okay, we're going to talk interior than exterior. So when you're painting the inside of your house, what is, is there a better time of year to paint? Does it matter? Doesn't matter. Okay. It doesn't matter at all. So people think, um, you know, winter like the time's humidity not I was thinking was be well, a yeah. It's in the summertime, humidity can, can can be a factor. Okay. It'll take longer for your paint to dry. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but uh, you can paint year round. Okay. So what about the exterior of the house? I mean, obviously, you don't want to be painting in the middle of January. I would think. <laughs> no, you want to exterior. You want to paint on a good day. Um, for, it should be um, 10 degrees above or consistently. Okay. Right. That's when the season starts, and uh, if it's too hot. It can cause problems. Your paint will bubble. Um, it'll basically fail. Okay. So the the general the, the, um, the rule of thumb is if you can keep your if you can't keep your hand on the surface for ten seconds, mm -hmm. it's too hot to paint. Okay. That's 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 the, the rule of thumb. Awesome. Yeah. So we we've just got a short bit of time left. But what is the what is one of the questions that somebody should ask when they're hiring a painter? What's the most important question? Are you insured? <laughs> you know, things happen. Ladders fall and we fall. Right. Your WSIB. Um, do you have your safety tickets? If you're on a roof, um, do you have worker heights? Mm -hmm. Can you work safely? And just, uh, are you going to protect my property? I got I got a garden, and tomatoes and stuff. Are you going to cover my bushes? Right. You know, things like that. Yeah, so you, pets, have, you, know. you have to do your research when you're when you're getting your house painted or you're planning on painting your house as well, right? Absolutely. Get three quotes, get three quotes, what I always say, mm -hmm. and uh, go with your gut feeling. Wonderful. Morris, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. And I want to thank you for joining us. I was so excited to be here live, and we want to thank the Orangeville uh, Lions Home and Gardens uh, team for letting us come here. Um, be sure to come out to the show. They're here till Sunday at 4 o'clock. And until next time, bye-bye for now.